thank you for joining us, everyone. We're just going to give it a few seconds um, to let people log on before we kick off formally. I can just see the the numbers uh, going up. So we'll just wait a, a few minutes for everyone to uh, get comfortable and, and ready for today's event. Well, I'll start by saying welcome to you all. My name is Sarah Turner and I'm Deputy Director at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art. Welcome to our online conference, uh, Mass Data Methodologies, and welcome virtually to the Paul Mellon Centre. We're a research institute and educational charity. We're physically located in Bedford Square in central London, just behind Oxford Street. But we're available to you all over the world through our digital presence and our website. Um, I encourage you to go and have a look on the website to see a broad range of our activities if you don't already know the centre. We are a publisher, we give grants and fellowships, we have an archive and library. Um, and if this is your first interaction with the centre, uh, a very special welcome uh, to you. And we hope it will be the first of many. And to those of you who are return visitors and old friends, it's great to have you with us today. As a research centre, we aim to create spaces and formats in which we can test and experiment with research and ideas. And today's event is very much organised in that spirit of conversation, of co collaboration, of exploring something together. Uh, last year, we held a workshop in which some of the participants who are with us today were included. And I know Martin Myro, my co convener is gonna say a bit more about um, the genesis of this event, just to give you some context and background to why we're here today and why we're thinking about mass data uh, methodologies. But we're really excited by uh, bringing these ideas together, of bringing mass data together with ideas about art history, art historiography and methodologies. I think this does point to some larger shifts um, in the field about the intersections between technologies and methodologies and the richness of questions about thinking through the individual in relationship to the group, the mass and the network. The Paul Mellon Centre, um, as a publisher, as I mentioned, of both print and digital uh, online resources and publications, is also interested in thinking about the possibilities and challenges of presenting um, this kind of work as well. And I just quickly wanted to point to uh, two examples of um, publications where perhaps we've been thinking in some ways about um, the intersection of mass data methodologies and art history. Um, that would be in our online um, journal, an open access born digital journal, British Art Studies. And you can find some um, articles there which are uh, exploring mass data issues and also our Royal Academy Chronicle. Um, and Danny's going to put the links to those publications in the chat. And I know that uh, one of our speakers is also going to use the data from the Royal Academy project as well. So it's great to see um, the afterlife of that uh, publication um, and the thinking around that um, being spoken about today. So we really uh, hope that, like I say, today will generate as many questions as it answers and think about further avenues and connections for thinking through uh, these ideas. And um, before we get on to more of the, the sort of meat um, of the intellectual inquiry of today, I just want to quickly walk you through some of the housekeeping that we have for Paul Mellon Centre uh, virtual gatherings to make sure that these are really enjoyable and productive spaces for everyone involved. And um, you can see that as audience members, you can really interact with the event. And we really encourage you to be active in the chat box. I can see um, that you're already interacting with us which is great so hi to everyone uh, in the chat box as well but if you want to put formal um, questions at the after um, the papers please type those in the Q&A uh, box and the chairs of our panel will read those out um, to um, the, the speakers um, and we also do have um, a function by which you can speak to us and we can hear you uh, and you can put your question live as it were by speaking if you'd like to do that you use the raise hand uh, function and we can then unmute you and ask you to join the conversation. 
the session is being recorded and made available to the public. And again, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at the recording section of the PMC website. We do try and record a lot of our events and they're becoming their own kind of online resource and publication in their own right. So it's they're a great resource to point to your students if you teach or any of your other networks as ways of, again, interacting with events that you might not have been able to participate in or watch uh, live. And um, you can also use the CC function um, to enable captioning, um, and you can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and again, like I say, to make sure this is a safe and productive environment, um, we, will, we do reserve the right to remove any audience members um, for offensive behaviour, but we really hope that doesn't happen and that this is, like I say, a really productive and generous space for everyone involved. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague and co-convener, Martin Myrone, to say uh, more about the topic and how we got here today. Hi, Martin, over to you. Yes, uh, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm, I'm Martin Myrone. I'm Head of Grants, Fellowships and Networks. Um, here at the Paul Mellon Centre and with um, Sarah Turner and Shreya Chatterjee, uh, we've kind of worked on, on framing today's event and sending out the invitation um, and well before anything else so thank you to everybody who's contributing today um, and everybody um, who's listening in or watching in as well um, even if you're not going to use the chat to post comments it's worth looking in on because I've just been seeing comments appearing from all around the world from Antwerp and Rome and Cairo um, and this yeah this it's, it is it isn't kind of international participation which is always fantastically heartening to sit to see and a reflection of um, the digital world that we're in which you know for all its limitations is also hugely enabling as well um, as Sarah's already kind of indicated, um, we've uh, been thinking about this event or something you know, in the area which would lead to this event for quite a while now. And actually kind of checking back through email exchanges and discussions, it was really the winter of 2020 to 21, where um, in a kind of in those kind of happy coincidences, we had several different conversations which seemed to indicate that uh, an awareness that out there in a whole range of different contexts with people working in potentially very different ways and uh, in different environments and to different ends, were nonetheless um, uh, engaged in research or book projects which were dealing with and representing um, large volumes of data um, in order to uh, meet some art historical objective or to address uh, an area of inquiry. Um, and there was a sense that um, there was, is there something new? Is there something um, novel? Is there something interesting? Is there something that's worth reflecting on in that range of work, um, accepting its diversity, that there may be some common ground or some common questions? Um, and I guess that there were probably a couple of points which, which occurred to us um, when we started with that observation. It was that um, a lot of this work um, was focused on objects and on the records of objects and the way objects have been circulated and recorded, notably in the art market. But there were also projects that were looking slightly differently at populations, at people, uh, kind of human um, uh, uh, data, uh, bodies of data relating to kind of human um, uh, 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 entities, artists and consumers. And that seemed to be kind of interesting. And that, so that was one thing to note. The other thing was uh, a sense that um, this wasn't digital, it was digital art history, but it wasn't something that was contained by the idea of digital art history. Um, the outputs might be digital. And we've mentioned a couple of projects already, which were which which have been um, published online, but there were also book projects. There were people who were working towards book and, and, and it argued people who were working towards kind of um, quite established art historical um, uh, perspectives as well. So technology was enabling, technology was facilitating, technology was the, was the medium, but it wasn't an end in itself. Um, so there seemed to be something there which wasn't being addressed in the discourse around digital art history, but was more about the intersection bit, between technology and mass data um, and, and, and art historical practice in a, in a broad sense. And in that regard, I guess it's notable that it's, it's, uh, there are precedents for the sorts of work that we're uh, um, recognizing and thinking needs to be represented and, and connected up, um, which were distinctly non-digital, which or which were developed before 
modern mass data technologies and thinking kind of Monty on on, in, on on Dutch art or white on white or 19th century France I'm sure they may have had some access to rudimentary databases but they were but they they were producing books and they were they were they were they were working bodies of material which were perhaps amassed and analyzed in ways which um, preceded the sorts of technical technological um, um, instruments that we have now and we are aware kind of broadly aware that there was a whole range of research questions that arise from this about um, uh, uh, how, how we think about artists as a group um, and how we think about previously neglected uh, source materials which were newly available, including exhibition catalogues, commercial directories, census records and news and media, um, all of which can be interrogated much more, much more uh, readily and in potentially very revealing ways. And out of that comes a question uh, uh, about uh, questions around what does it mean to think about artistry beyond, beyond the singular? Uh, to think about the mass rather than the individual, about patterns and populations. Uh, what, does it, what does it mean to think not about individual objects, but objects in, in, in large volumes? And uh, what does it think, mean to think about artistic pop populations and how these intersect with larger political entities like community, class and nation? So that led to uh, an exploratory session in May 2021, include, which included a number of people here, here today, but also uh, Paris Spies Gans, and uh, whose uh, book on uh, women artists being, which was due to be published by the Paul Mellon Center, which is now out, uh, was one of the projects which we thought was interesting in that it was, you know, it was a book project, but it was utilizing large volumes of information. Um, and that um, workshop really um, uh, kind of uh, uh, just kind of looking at what what work was out there and what the potential was led eventually to the call for papers and to today's session. Um, the questions which are kind of very much on our mind today, as we hear the presentations, are well, there's a fundamental question, rather brutal question: Why do this work? What's the point? You know. Um, what impacts does uh, what impact does mass data have upon art historical methodologies? What does it mean to have this data, um, and what impact does it have on art history as a discipline? Um, but most of all, and this I think is the kind of undercurrent which emerged out of that exploratory workshop and which we're thinking about today. What can we learn from each other? What can we learn across disciplines, across methodologies? Uh, across national and cultural contexts, um, across different kinds of material and different periods. And although we, know, we as the Paul Mellon Centre um, are very much focused on British art, and that's our raison d'etre, and that's what we're, we're aiming for, we have a very open and porous idea of what British art is. It's a place to start asking questions rather than end in itself. Um, and today's uh, 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 activities have been framed by, uh, without reference to British art as a limiting notion. Um, there are people addressing British art, but we're really interested in creating uh, international connections and uh, uh, facilitating a kind of comparative um, dialogue across disciplines, across fields, uh, in order to, we hope, kind of enrich and uh, deepen our understanding of mass data methodologies and art history. Hence the range of papers and the range of presentations that we have today, which cover, um, I think, quite a kind of dazzling array, potentially dazzling array of materials, periods, methodologies, and kinds of work. And I think without further ado, we should move into um, panel one. The format um, for today is to have quite um, succinct papers, but they've got 15 minute slots for each presentation. A number of presentations are, are collaborative. They have more than one speaker involved. Um, and we will run through uh, the papers in sequence. I will very briefly introduce the speakers. There are fuller biographies online and then have a more sustained Q&A session uh, uh, to take us up to the, the, the lunchtime break uh, uh, where we'll reflect uh, and, and, and go into conversation around the, around the presentations together. So, panel one, um, we're going to start uh, with uh, Anita Gowers and Paul Wilson. Um, Anita Gowers has worked in the uh, higher education sector across a range of disciplines from neuroscience to the creative, creative industries and is currently undertaking an artistry PhD on the Australian picture framing industry at the Australian National University. Uh, Paul Wilson uh, focuses on applying technologies to advance our individual and collective thinking and performance, and has produced a whole range of data analysis and visualizations, including large historical data sets, um, and has authored postgraduate courses on technology 
leadership and data science. And together they are addressing, well, this is a pretty fundamental question, why art history needs data science. So over to you, Anita and Paul. Thank you very much. I will share my screen. Okay, just confirming you can see the start of the that's, presentation now. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Martin. Our purpose today is to share some brief insights into what data science is about, how you can use it effectively, and the implications for art history research. To begin with, I'm not an art historian myself. I've worked across fields, including a range of data science projects over about 20 years. My co-presenter, Anita Gowers, will explore some analysis of art history data in a bit more detail. I'm going to briefly explore some origin ideas and approaches to data science. The basic story of data science is about, it comes from our limited mental capabilities and the discovery that we can use things outside ourselves and actually need to, to advance the way we think. Um, there's a lot of recent research from Nobel Prize winners like uh, Daniel Kahneman and uh, Richard Thaler that has recognised the limitations of our thinking and the importance of being able to leverage the things that are a part of what's called our the extended mind that's out of the work of um, uh, David Chalmers and Andy Clark from the late 1990s. This is a really interesting, exciting area. I'd encourage you to have a bit more of a look into it, but I won't go into much details now. Um, the key thing is that the massive growth of technology has really changed what's possible. And businesses and industry are really getting uh, involved in taking on what's called data-driven decision-making. And the World Bank and others are talking about a fourth industrial revolution. So the the activities going on here are part of a much larger puzzle. And also means there's going to be an interesting feedback loop between different fields of human endeavor as different fields pick up and really start to accelerate with these sets of ideas and technologies. In terms of practical points, I'd suggest that you routinely use data visualizations to review your data and findings. Most of our brains are dedicated to processing visual information and it just makes it much easier to see if there's some glitch in your data or even something that was unexpected that leads to a new insight. Tables of numbers just don't work. And I, for that reason, I strongly encourage you to hunt anomalies until you resolve them. You never know where the, the I've discovered glitch in, glitches in the Australian Bureau of Statistics data and been able to confirm that they've got a, an issue there. So make, not making assumptions about the data is important too. Um, I anticipate that data science will be new to many people in the field of art history research. Uh, in these circumstances, a particularly nice method to use is topic modelling or latent Dirichlet allocation. This is substantially based on the work of David Bly. Uh, it provides a nice way to discover the thematic structure in large collections of documents um, and to help visualise them. It's, nice because you don't actually need to put a structure into the text this process will start just classifying things without you needing to have any initial ideas i've used this process for about 10 years it involves a little bit of work to get the documents ready but uh, it's very versatile and you can build up on it in various ways so the example of david's work i've got here is classified uh, the content of science magazine articles of decades. And you could probably do the same sort of thing with uh, information about different artists across time to get just a bit of a flavour of what's happening. Um, it's not about presenting particular answers, but exploring for themes that might be worth um, delving into in a little bit more detail. He's also used this to analyse the reading habits of US politicians and figure out a bit more about uh, 
Paul, I just want to check. I'm I, I'm not seeing the change of your slides, and I think I'm just looking in oh. the um, chat box and other people. No. There, we no, there we go. Perfect. Right. Yeah, gonna, thank you. Right. So that's David Bly, and that's the uh, the analysis that I was talking about there. Um, he's got a very interesting presentation um, on YouTube, uh, probabilistic topic models, um, and that goes through some of these in a bit more detail. Uh, I'll keep moving along. I'll make sure, yes. I worked for a company that had $40 million to help Tasmanian business and industry adopt e-commerce at one stage. And a lot of business and industry groups were applying for funding. And what I found was that there was somebody else in the world who had already done what this particular business or industry was thinking of. What that means is you don't need to consider the that you're doing something new and unique. You can test out ideas by just looking around to see what people have done. It's almost like you're a research lab without having to spend any money or effort. So one of the sites that's useful for this is Flying Data. They've got a subscription service and um, various uh, explanations and tutorials that with actual examples of what you can do. Um, it's an alternative. I'd suggest that uh, for people getting into the field, you don't necessarily need to leap into the details yourself. You might be able to find a, a young graduate or postgraduate student and uh, have them pursue some of this for you. Um, Another interesting group is Kaggle. They have a large community of data scientists. They have data sets and they have notebooks which are full explanations or code to do different types of analysis. Another interesting thing they do is have competitions. This is where a company provides a data set and some goal and perhaps a financial reward. And what happens is they, they reward the diet data scientists who contribute to a solution. So this is nice because you don't need to understand the technologies involved or the concepts involved. You can get some very smart people working on uh, the challenge that you're trying to understand without um, needing to be an expert yourself. Ah. Um, just a, on a final sort of a note, uh, the movie Moneyball is quite an interesting uh, example of what can be done with data analytics. The basic story is that uh, talent scouts for however long uh, the sport had been played had been focused on developing or identifying people to recruit. But uh, a Yale economist and a coach realised that they can apply data analytics methods and get high performing teams for much less money. And I found it really quite interesting that the, the author of this work, the researcher, said that a lot of the human experts that were involved in this scouting activity were focused on the really flashy aspects of the, the player's behaviour, like being able to hit or run and this sort of thing. But there was really important other things that were more subtle that had been missed entirely. And I think that provides a scope for thinking that maybe there's some things in the artistic side of things or in understanding uh, great works that have been overlooked for some subtle reason that might not be apparent. Um, in conclusion, I think one of the interesting things is the technology convergence that's going on. There's analysis methods that uh, can put on uh, a platform for one domain of human knowledge can equally be applied to others. And in the same way, career paths are converging. Data science professionals are in demand. So just as the nature of the work means you don't, uh, you'll have, you're not locked into art history. And that's probably a good thing because there's so many ideas that can be drawn from elsewhere. So there'll be pathways into and out of art history and that I think will fuel a positive cycle of growth. Um, it's also worth noting that art history is heading into interesting competitive territory. We've got a lot of focus on having people's attention um, and allowing them to pursue their interests in a useful way. But the, this is a bit of a challenging area because something else is a mouse click away. So 
it's really important that offerings are compelling, engaging, and uh, allow some sort of interaction, I'd suggest, to really help people feel engaged and get value. Finally, if you're starting out your data science project for the first time, remember it's fine to start small. There's no need to take on the world. It's actually a lot of fun to create analysis insights that people haven't seen before. They get excited and you will too. And even a small effect, you know, small success makes the next step easier to take. Thanks very much. I'll hand over to Anita. I'll just share my screen. Right, can everyone see my slides? That's great, thanks Anita. Terrific, and thank you very much, Paul. And hello everyone. Um, as mentioned, I'm Anita and I'm a PhD candidate in the Centre for Art History at ANU. Let me begin by saying upfront, I am not a data scientist and I am not a statistician. So what I'm presenting today is basically the useful things that I've picked up about how to interrogate art history data using scientific methodologies. So in other words, I'm giving the practical to Paul's theoretical provocations. Dr. Sarah Turner generously shared a subset of data behind the online archives, the Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, a chronicle 1769 to 2018. It's a longitudinal data set, and whilst there are a couple of patchy areas of the data, it is still considerably a remarkable time frame for a data set that is found within the discipline of art history. And the information on this website is presented in depth and annually. So here is a cut and paste from some of the slides that are online on Chronicle 250, displayed from 1769. And what we can see here, <clears throat> depicting the exhibitors of Royal Academy members and non-Academy members as a percentage within a pie chart. And on the right-hand side, it's the number of works displayed. And that includes all works, again, by the Academy members and non-Academy members. So what is really clearly visual with these pie charts is that for 1769, there were far more academicians compared to non-academicians, and logically, there were more works by members of the academy. But what I'm interested in is examining this subset to see if there are longitudinal trends that span the entire data set, which will potentially generate questions about the data. So I've received this data in an Excel file format consisting of 17 variables and realized relatively quickly that mapping each of these would be incredibly time consuming. So we decided to pop this information into a scatter matrix. Don't adjust your eyesight. I have done the font small deliberately. So essentially a scatter matrix is a set of points plotted on a horizontal and a vertical axis to give a summary of all of the relationships between the variables. It visualizes these pairs, allowing many relationships to be explored within the one chart, within the one single visualization. And what the diagonal shows the distribution of the data, the data above the diagonal plots the inverse of the data below. So in other words, it swaps the vertical and the horizontal diagonals. And with a quick glance, a few things jump out. We can see the remarkable similarities between the number of academicians and the number of exhibits because they track nicely together. However, there's something interesting going on within the exhibition length, which is up here, and as well as the attendance, which is here, and also the sales, because you would assume the longer the exhibition, the more people and the more sales. So to look at that data further, I've popped it into a bar chart. So the, this is the exhibitors with academy members and non-academy members. So again, don't adjust your eyes. The point of this bar chart is for your eyes to look for the anomalies in the data without focusing on the numbers. So you can see this bar chart displays 
the academicians, which is the blue, which is remarkably consistent over time, with the exception of the very first year being 1769, and the non-academicians. We can see some significant variations here, 1771, there's a drop in 1805, sort of 1850 to 1860 here. There's some high points, a drop here, which is First World War, Second World War, and also the Brenton Wood system in the early 1970s. If we take that same information and drop it into what's called a percentage stacked bar chart, this time we can see the 1769 data which was barely visible here, absolutely pops out at us in this demonstration of methodology. 1771 also pops out, and you can see some of these other anomalies as well. So the display of the data impacts how we mentally perceive it. I've done the same thing here with exhibits and year, showing the non-members in red and the Royal Academy members in blue, and again, you can see this remarkable variation. So as art historians, you'd be looking at these variations to then go back to the data, say, well, why are there these peaks? Why are there these troughs? And potentially on a very broad scale, we could say, well, maybe there's a much stronger relationship between non-academy members exhibiting depending on what's going on in the broader world. These gaps here represent the gaps in the data. And when we pop this exact same information back into the stack chart, we can also again see how it shows us different things, particularly this one, which wasn't really noticeable in the former chart. Now, this visualization is a scatter plot and that shows the relationships between two discontinuous variables. We can see clusters and each dot on the scatter plot represents a pair of exhibition length and attendance. So intuitively, you would think that the longer an exhibition, you would achieve a greater attendance. But what the data shows is that over the last 250 years, exhibitions that lasted approximately 90 days achieved the maximum visitor numbers. And exhibitions longer than 90 days didn't necessarily increase attendance. Again, whilst this scatter plot plots greater sales, they're correlated to exhibitions. So what we can see is that 70 days is basically the medium length. So the correlation is not causation. So whilst there are relationships between the variables, one doesn't necessarily cause the other. And in both of these scatter plots, they are only comparing two variables and there are clearly other things at play. So in other words, making an exhibition in length 70 days is not necessarily going to achieve more sales. But when data is presented in using these scientific methodologies, it helps you ask more questions and refine what you're looking at. So by asking questions of the data drives new discoveries and by looking at the data using scientific methodologies, it helps contextualize art history for us and it actually makes it more relevant for those outside of the discipline. It is not a panacea for art history research. It is not a conveyor belt process where you enter the data, convert it to visuals and suddenly you have the answer in your PhD. Data needs to be tuned. It's a process of exploring, looking, examining, and checking that will generate new questions and new research. So data science is a different way of understanding our contribution to the Commonwealth of Art History knowledge. And it is imperative that we as art historians adapt these new data science techniques alongside traditional art historical methodologies in order to adopt new generations to explore art history. And I hope this has been helpful in showing how visualising data in our discipline provides new avenues, potentially with new future research questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, both of you, for a, a, a really kind of visually stimulating as well as kind of intellectually stimulating start, start, start of the day. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so still, yeah, never quite sure what to do with this. So applause, applause, you know, there are smiles, you can put thumbs up. Um, but also, if you've got questions, uh, observations, comments, 
Um, we will take them together in the uh, the Q and A um, session. But I think you can post questions at any time in the Q and A box. So it's quite you know if something is occurring to you, do take the opportunity to put it down now. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll turn to them in the in the in the group discussion um, after our next two presentations. Um, and we'll move on um, next to uh, Shane Marcy, who's a PhD candidate in the his Department of Art, Art History, and Visual Studies at Duke University, and. Um, Shane's presentation today is a Digital Humanities as a Fundamental Methodological Approach, a Case Study of the Postcard Craze, which I understand it, um, uh, relates very closely to your, your doctoral um, project. Although I know you're also a active author on the online Dictionary of Art Historians. So I think things kind of connect together over the morning as well. Well, yeah. So um, over to you, Shane. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep, that's all good. That's great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Anita and Paul. That was fascinating, especially what Paul mentioned about the importance of starting small uh, and maybe even the, the pathway out of art history that you mentioned. Um, but so I won't reiterate what you've just said in your introduction, but I am involved in a number of, um, of digital projects. I'm, I'm the project manager of Digital Public Buildings North Carolina, but I do also participate in the Dictionary of Art Historians. And I also do other work at the collab at Duke around 3D printing and trying to expand the parameters of, um, of what can be done with that as a medium. Sorry, just sharing my screen there. Greg, can you see that now? Excellent. Sorry yep, about that. See that. That's good. Um, but this particular project um, is distinct for a number of reasons. For a start, it represents, as you mentioned, a component of my own dissertation. But it's also a case study on the basis of which I want to suggest a, a kind of broad but relatively simple argument in favor of mass data methodologies as a kind of fundamental aspect of research in the humanities. That is a kind of a rudimentary digital research as a kind of basic form of best practice based on the accessibility of a wide range of tools and the increasing availability of digitized data, especially in the form of online archives. And the capacity that these resources hold for carrying out kind of manageable projects that are limited in scope, but which have the potential to, to overturn uh, long held assumptions and assumptions that were made at a time when this kind of research was far less feasible. So my dissertation, just in brief, looks at American modernity through the lens of the postcard craze, which took place between um, in the United States between about 1907 and 1920, during which period the nation was inundated with these objects. And I explore the medium as both an object of art historical investigation, um, but also as an exemplary form of mass produced commodity in order to ask questions about in particular, the political economy of the progressive era. I think maybe the best way to just succinctly describe my kind of evolving approach to the medium is to look at the relationship between both sides of the object. Um, on the one hand, on the one side, um, through an exploration of the inscribed messages, I ask how the postcard's insistence on personal interaction was able to establish a uniquely intimate engagement with what was often a kind of quite alienating mass produced commodity form. On the other side of the object, I'm looking at the image, uh, especially the view card and exploring how it adapted new technologies, uh, photography, which was accorded a kind of scientific verisimilitude, but also chromolithography, which carried profoundly commercial connotations. Um, and how these came together through the scale of the postcard craze to create a kind of totalizing and commodified vision of reality, maybe what Walter Benjamin might describe or, or Marx might describe as a phantasmagoria. Um, and ultimately I argue that in putting the two sides together, that the intimacy created by the personal engagement with the commodity form allowed for a far stronger kind of identification with this phantasmagoric reality that's suggested by the medium's imagery. And that in doing so, the medium helped to establish a very particular and important form of identification between the modern individual and the commodity form. And, and significantly, this took place at a time when this was precisely what the American advertising industry was striving for. And of course, you know, this kind of relationship continues to exert a, a powerful force in our own everyday experiences. But that's the project overall. 
the digital component of this was concerned with something far more specific, which was visualizing the scale of the craze. Now, specifically the numbers of postcards purchased in the United States. Um, so as such, uh, in terms of this project, this is primarily a, a production analysis. And it's crucial because part of the argument is that these images were produced in such quantities and were so ubiquitous um, that they impacted the way in which people perceived their, their everyday experiences. So in terms of the phenomenon scale, um, both the scholarship and the primary sources um, clearly convey a narrative of this explosion in postcard sales uh, alluded to in this image of Uncle Sam drowning in a sea of postcards, followed by a complete crash. Um, and so what I, what I did, first of all, was to gather information in order to verify this assumption. Um, and so I, so I set about visualizing the existing data, that is the data for the postcard craze that is currently cited in the literature. Um, and this is based on a book um, by George and Dorothy Miller, uh, upon which almost all of the subsequent scholarship relies. And the numbers themselves are drawn from the Postmaster's General Annual Report, which is a government document that has been made available online in recent years. Uh, and what the Millers do is that they, state, they cite the data for the years that, that they believe represent the peak of the craze, which for them is about 1908 to 1913. So this is a very small data set that they're using, and it looks like this when it's visualized. And on the basis of this data, the Millers determined that the peak of the craze occurs in about 1913, when about 1 billion postcards were sent annually. So in short, what the Millers did was they decided they knew the dates of the craze. They went and got the data to back that up at a time when this data was far less accessible. And since then, uh, nobody has kind of critiqued this methodology in spite of the fact that several books have been written on the subject, uh, one of which explicitly adopts a digital approach to focus on American postcards. So I wanted to take a more comprehensive view. So the next thing I did was to gather all of the data uh, from the Postmaster's General Report between 1873 and 1930. This evolved going through um, every annual Postmaster's General Report, finding the number of postcards at sites, entering it on Airtable, which was also able to, to tabulate this often kind of quite fragmented data for me, um, and then visualizing it on Tableau. And what this si relatively simple chart showed was really, really interesting and importantly, not readily apparent from just looking at the data. What I expected to see was a huge rise starting in 1906, and followed by a complete crash around 1913, I guess a kind of bell curve. Um, but actually what we see is this image here. And this is really significant because there's no boom and bust here. Instead, what we're looking at is a really slow, gradual incline interrupted only after World War I in 1917, when the price of uh, mailing a postcard was temporarily doubled. But the number reverts to the previous trajectory almost immediately and, and continues along that line well past 1913 into the 1950s. So it was this visualization that brought my attention to the fact that there's a discrepancy between the accepted narrative of boom and bust that we know occurred because of the overwhelming number of primary resources that attest to it, and the numbers that are being cited in the scholarship, which show nothing of the sort, and that I needed to, to explain this. And what I eventually realized was the Postmaster's General Report, which the Miller is citing, uh, was only referencing one subset of postcards. In its most simple terms, it only showed government-issued postcards, which were known as postal cards. And the explanation for this is that these postal cards were the only kind of postcard available prior to 1898, when the government had, the United States government had uh, a monopoly on the medium, which they relinquished then and allowed privately issued postcards to enter into the market. But there's very little data for these cards because um, in part, the majority of them were produced in Germany, but they were also produced in both in Germany and the United States by numerous private manufacturers. Uh, and the reason that there's such specific data for government issued postal cards is because they contained a pre-printed stamp, which is essentially kind of cash and uh, therefore had to be accounted for quite carefully. So this strongly suggested that the real scale of the craze was far greater than previously had been understood, that extended far beyond 
um, government issued postal cards and included these privately produced postcards. But it raised the problem of accounting for this uh, set of private postcards. And I started to search around for what kind of available data could we chart that might help us to approximate the scale of the craze. Um, and after searching around for a while, I eventually turned to the sales of, of one cent stamps. I noticed that in the primary sources, um, stamps are identified as a proxy for the craze. So you might see an interview with a post office cashier in Atlantic City or somewhere uh, who says that the sale of one cent stamps has gone through the roof thanks to the craze. And you see this mentioned many times in the primary sources. Um, and the data for the stamps was also included in the same Postmaster's General Report um, because all postage stamps, like postal cards, were issued by the state. And unfortunately, the specific data drops out from the report after 1913, after a new uh, Postmaster General is, report, is appointed by, by Woodrow Wilson. Uh, but it remains a really solid and reliable data set. And so based on, on my expectations, again, what I was expecting to see here was a sharp rise in around 1906 and a peak in 1910. And that was exactly what this visualization showed. So what we're looking at here, um, the orange line at the bottom shows the slow growth of government issued postal cards over time. And this orange line at the bottom was previously assumed to represent the numbers for the entire craze. The red line shows um, the expected sale of one cent stamps during this period. This is an algorithm that we've been working on um, that attempts to project the number of postcards that we, excuse me, num the number of one cent stamps that we would expect to be sold during this period. It's still something that we have to refine slightly to take into account for um, rural free delivery and things like that. But generally speaking, it's relatively accurate line. And the blue line shows the actual sale of one cent stamps during the postcard craze. And we see an uptick immediately after 1898. And here we have the, the beginnings of an outline, at least, of a true kind of boom and bust cycle. So in short, the primary source upon which all this literature relied had the dates approximately right, but the numbers completely wrong. Uh, and what this rudimentary digital visualization showed was that the number of postcards sent through the mail at the peak of the craze, which was assumed to be about uh, 1 billion, which I think is already an extremely high number, was in fact closer to 3.5 billion. Uh, and this is really significant in terms of the actual scale of the craze and the breadth of its impact. But you know, obviously, you're probably thinking, yeah, but what about all the postcards that were produced but weren't sent through the mail? For example, there was a huge culture of collecting and scrapbooking postcards. Um, so I was also presented with the problem of approximating this number. And this is where the data is the patchiest. However, there are a number of kind of corroborating facts to back up the small number of data points that I have identified. But this part is really still a work in progress. Um, and so I started looking for government tariff schedules online at the Library of Congress and discovered that after, 18, nine, after 1908 and the passage of the Payne Aldrich Tariff Acts, postcards are classified individually within them. I haven't yet been able to identify the specific government report that details the classification of the tariffs, but I found references to these elsewhere. Um, and that's the data that I visualize in the final chart for the years between 1906 and 1909, based on the figures for these imports. And what I want to draw your attention to here is the bright yellow line at the top, which represents an approximation of the total number of cards imported to the US from Germany during this period. And you can see how these numbers dwarf the original estimates. So the final uh, total for the peak of the craze represents the 1 billion postcards that are initially considered to constitute the entire phenomenon, plus up to as, as many as potentially 9 billion apported from Germany, um, of which approximately 2.5 billion were mailed. And of course, this 9 billion figure doesn't even include postcards produced within the United States, of which there were many, especially after 1908. So the digital tools and resources help to both identify and demonstrate the fact that we were dealing with an, a phenomenon that was almost an order of magnitude greater than previously had been assumed. And in terms of the significance for my research, we're now looking at a medium that penetrated everyday life in a way that we had kind of never anticipated. 
but from a broader perspective, what I want to argue is that, that this points to the usefulness of existing accumulations of mass data um, in digital archives that can be accessed with relative ease. And that the fact of this availability combined with, with the usability and the accessibility um, of tools such as Airtable and Tableau help to establish an argument for the digital humanities as a kind of fundamental instrument of best practice. That is not, not as a supplement so much, but something more basic to the discipline of art history. You know, instead of suggesting a digital approach as a potentially usable methodology, I feel as if it raises the question as to whether we should be asking why is such an approach absent or what precludes any given project from at least a rudimentary digital analysis using sources and tools that were previously unavailable, but are now far more widely accessible. And then finally, at the same time, there's potential for a larger project here, I feel. I think it points towards opportunities to engage with other digitized collections. I'm thinking of the New York Public Library in particular, uh, where you might be able to take advantage of either a digital content analysis um, or indeed the emerging technology around a handwriting analysis, or perhaps most interestingly, um, a relational analysis of, of these two facets. Thank you. Fantastic. And yeah, there are all sorts of applause, visual applause, visual applause around the room and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for, for that. Fantastic. And thank you for um, I mean, some, some mind boggling numbers in there as well. We've sort of moved in terms of volume to uh, the billions already. And it's it's not even one o'clock. So fantastic for that. Um, we'll keep moving. As I say, do keep up your if you've got um, comments about the, uh, uh, the, the anything on the tech side or or about the event as a whole, do post them in the chat questions for the panelists to have ready put them in the Q&A, um, they can be um, lined up for our, our discussion um, section. Um, but we'll move straight on now to our third, uh, uh, third and final presentation um, in this uh, morning um, panel, the panel one. Um, and we're sticking with Duke, with uh, Hannah, Paul and Lee. Um, Hannah uh, L. Jacobs is Digital Humanities Specialist for Duke University's Digital Art History and Visual Culture Lab, Visual Culture Research Lab, um, and is studying for a Master's in Information Science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Paul Jasko is a Professor of Art History and German Studies at Duke and is co-director of the Digital Art History and Visual Culture Research Lab. And Lee Sorensen is a librarian and bibliographer at Duke University and another co-founder and co-editor of the Dictionary of Art Historians. And it is indeed the Dictionary of Art Historians Studying Art History at Scale, which is the title of this presentation. So welcome our three presenters over to you hello everyone and and thank you so much for for having us um i'm gonna kick things off and then i'll pass things over to lee so the dictionary of art historians is an open online resource that documents the lives of art historians of mostly western art the project is supported by Duke University's Digital Art History and Visual Culture Research Lab with Lee and I as co-PIs and Paul is our research collaborator. Through the lab and funds from Duke's Office of Undergraduate Research Support, we work with student research assistants to draft new entries, revise existing entries, and continue to improve the data structure. In today's presentation, we'll be sharing the project's history, showing the latest version of the website and database, and discussing possible research questions that the, da the dictionary's data might support. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> like few contemporary database sites, the Dictionary of Art Historians was begun as a paper project over 40 years ago and has developed as the internet developed. It started with a specific mission for graduate students to research significant Western art historians by their methodology. It includes only art historians who have died or at, are at the end of their careers. There are over 3,000 entries covering globally historians of Western art. Each entry focuses on a biobibliographic form, the art historian's familial background, schools they attended and faculty under whom they studied. It integrates the historian's writings in the chronology of their lives as in fact they happened. It identifies debates and animosities, 
concluding with bibliography of their own writings and sources of their information used and the art historian's archives if available. However, similar to many contemporary databases, the dictionary's goals and structures broadened and sharpened by the examining crowd use and feedback. When the project joined Duke's Digital Art History and Visual Culture Research Lab in 2017, it was brought up to date functionally by loading the static files into a content management tool and migrating it to the Drupal open source software, all through the auspices of our second presenter and the project's co-editor, Hannah Jacobs. The previous clunky way of keyword searching was replaced with the construction of discrete fields for the most common queries, gender, institution, country of birth and death, and subject specialty of the historian. Concerning the dictionary's content, we were lucky to be able to use the early general art historiographies, which were the beginning, which were beginning to appear. In addition, the published collections of specific groups of art historians appeared, we were able to mirror current scholarship. One of these was the massive inventory of German art historians who fled Nazi Germany between 1933 and 45 by Ulrike Wendland that Paul will speak about. It's important to note that the data of Wendland's book is still only available in searchable form in our dictionary. Today, the project boasts of unique data groups of art historians, most notably women historians and those of color. As we approach representative data, visualizing and graphically analyzing our discoveries for the first time, we are truly able to study art history at scale. Thank you, Lee. And we're going to take a, a brief tour of the latest version of the website and database. The dictionary's website and database are designed as a tool to help researchers working at a range of scales. So from studying an individual, as Lee mentioned, to investigating themes across many entries. The site is built in Drupal also, as Lee mentioned, and this version that you're seeing today has just been launched in Drupal 9, and we're going to be migrating it to Drupal 10 very shortly. This is a major upgrade for the site, uh, not just in terms of the platform, but also in terms of uh, some of the data work that we've been doing to improve uh, scalability. Individual entries and, uh, provide basic demographic information such as names, birth and death dates, birth and death places, countries of origin or residence, and gender. And we also document institutions that art historians have worked at, the types of careers they have had, and their major fields of study. And Lee did not mention the careers, I'll say, because that is a, one of the newest fields that, that we've just uh, uh, made available. As mentioned, our research assistants work with Lee to draft biographical entries, the overview field, in which we also link between uh, entries to help readers experience the many relationships that are represented in the dictionary. Contributors are also able to develop a selected uh, bibliography of the art historian's work, a list of sources used to create the entry, and when available, links to archives that hold the art historian's papers. Each entry is attributed to all those who contribute that entry, which allows our students to point to their work on resumes and applications. On an individual entry page under more resources, researchers can access links to other prominent data repositories and online collections that contain relative uh, relevant information about an art historian. This feature developed out of a 2019 workshop with the Getty Research Institute, as well as an earlier partnership with the Getty Research Portal. And you'll see the, the more resources links include the Archives of American Art, the Dictionary of French Art Historians, the Digital Public Library of America, as well as the, the Getty Research Portal and the Social Networks and Archival Context Project and Wikidata and WorldCat. To help researchers find entries of interest, we continue to offer a full text database search. But for those who want to see what's represented in the dictionary, we uh, have a browse page where they can search through uh, entries alphabetically. Uh, folks can also filter uh, entries by gender, country, subject area, institution, and career type. 
We also provide a directory that lists all of the entries by name, along with some key contextual data as an, as an alternative form of browsing. Entries data fields rely on a number of data standards, which are documented in the about section of the website under data access. All of our data fields are mapped to the Dublin Core metadata standard and our standardized vocabularies include the Getty's thesaurus of geographic names for place names, the Getty's art and architecture thesaurus and homosaurus. We also add our own localized terminology where necessary, and this information is documented in our data dictionary. For scholars wishing to study many entries, we offer an API that allows researchers to download data or to connect our data set with their own in a separate web application. All content is licensed under a Creative Commons uh, attribute share alike license to encourage digital, digital scholarship. And the data are currently available as JSON, but we can make uh, formats such as XML and CSV available as well. And we're also in the process of submitting the data set to Duke's digital repository as an archival record of our uh, work to date. And just to give you an initial sense of the makeup of our data set, here's a visualization um, showing countries of residence for art historians who were active in the 20th century. Likewise, a, a visualization showing subject areas represented among 20th century art historians. These two visualizations were created um, by my first uh, exporting the data and doing some minor data transformation. And then I shared that data with our lab's uh, graduate assistant, Dana Hogan, who was able to plug the data into the visualization software Tableau to produce these uh, exploratory visualizations. Finally, we have an extensive and multilingual about section that describes the project, a blog where we post periodic updates about our work and our contact information. And, and we always welcome information about art historians who should be included, updates or corrections to existing entries and other exp expressions of interest. So now I'm gonna hand things over to Paul who will share some of our digital research that draws on the dictionary's data. Uh, thanks, Hannah. Thanks, Lee. Uh, if I can have the, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Uh, having looked at the origin and structure of the Dictionary of Art Historians, I want to turn our attention to how exactly one category of evidence mentioned by Lee can extend from the DOAH data to address a significant question of art historical research. Here we focus on well-known aspect of European uh, Euro-American art history, namely the migration and exile of Jewish and leftist art historians from Nazi Germany, 1933 to 45. Such a history is well known in terms of individual biographies, of course, like Krautheimer, but scaling up the question to include the large number of art historians in the DOAH who were exiles allows us to see patterns and movements that raise new questions about the history of the spread of art history itself. In addition, this extended analysis also allows us to reflect back on the other sections, since dealing with a large number of art historians in aggregate points back to the data structure of the DOAH in the first place, as well as how the site may be extended through linked open data and attending to interoperable functionalities. Thinking about the structure of the DOAH as well as visualization possibilities, how can we test its potential with the subgroup of exiles? Here we start with the source that Lee has mentioned and contributed much to the DOAH, Ulrike Wendland's Biographisches Handbuch, Deutschsprachige Kunsthistoriker in Exil. We developed a data set from these art historians in DOAH and then extended that with additional geographic and temporal data from Wendland. From this, we were able to map the movement of art historians from Germany to the world, such as this map of the final post-war destination of all German exiles listed in the dictionary. This and the other maps we have created show known patterns like the early move to Paris and London, for example, but also more unexpected locations, such as the importance of non-coastal locations in the United States. Furthermore, an animation, if I give you, thank you, an animation helps us to see the clustering here in the United States of the initial move in exile, but also the move within the United States of US, uh, or of exiles possibly indicating the precarious nature of their unemployment as they moved from site to site. The point here would be that the biographical nature of the dictionary has led us to non-biographical systemic categories that then form a context in turn 
for the distinct entries of the DOAH. Working at different scales pushes the DOAH to the level of a research site and also expands its potential. In this regard, we are thinking about how we can start to connect systemic questions with our biographical dictionary. For example, we have begun to extract questions about social and intellectual networks by pulling out bibliographic information of the DOAH, such as this map of the exile path of any art historian who was active at the Warburg Institute, both in its Hamburg and London iterations. I would argue that this map is in and of itself not that interesting, except as an exploratory site. The visualization in this sense may lead us to other questions, such as whether these specific exiles also shared professional or intellectual trajectories after leaving Nazi Germany. Can we, for example, see patterns in terms of which journals the Warburg group of exiles published? Are these patterns indications of standard career choices and publishing venues like the Art Bulletin? Or do they cluster around editorial boards through the social network of the institution or content from intellectual communities. In either case, the extension of the exile work from the DOAH leads us back to ask systemic questions of the DOAH as a means of expanding its scholarly use. In the end, producing and using the DOAH allows us to think about the intellectual questions and preconceptions that were specific to each phase of our analysis. We learned as we thought through the structure and history of the DOAH, as much as we learned through exploring its digital and art historical possibilities. We also learned through the process of entering and visualizing data, a process of knowledge building that is certainly well known to the digital humanities. Ultimately, our goal is to see scholarship, in this case, art historical, and resource building as dialogically engaged intellectual practices that are too often separated institutionally and epistemologically in our worlds. And I want to emphasize that last point, that resource building and scholarship are integrated activities, not necessarily distinct processes. In sum, our argument calls for more engagement between the areas of digital and evidential expertise in order to draw out the complexity of critical questions concerning human experience, as well as its current expression through digital and art historical means. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to the Q&A. Here again is our website. Um, we encourage you to, to check it out. Thank you. Thank you all. Again, sort of round of applause uh, for sharing some of the kind of front of house and back of house of, of such an amazing resource. Um, we've got a couple of questions lined up already, which we will um, come to in a moment. But do, if you've got comments, observations on any of the papers, uh, any of the presentations this morning, do post them um, on the, in the Q&A. We've got a bit of time now for discussion around the panel. So if everybody, everybody who's a speaker this morning should, I think, kind of unmute and be ready to, to, to jump in. I mean, I've got um, a couple of thoughts, really, but I've got a very kind of basic question, a probably rather stupid question, um, which you may want to dismiss immediately, which is about, um, well, in all three presentations, there's a lot of emphasis and um, importance put on visualization and the possibilities of visualizing data, visualizing information, not just because it communicates effectively, or, you know, does a good job or is instantaneous, but because it can actually reveal things that you would not be aware of otherwise. There's a kind of revelatory dimension to, to visualization. Um, and with that in mind, I wonder, perhaps around the, the panel, what attention you give, if any, to almost the aesthetics of that visualization, even things like the choice of colors. I mean, it's very striking. You know, anybody who has to kind of make an Excel chart, you know, when it the column that comes up pink sort of jumps out and the column that's pale blue recedes. So I, I mean, I wonder in terms of your own projects and your own work, um, what emphasis do you put on those aesthetics? How much you depend on kind of off the shelf um, kit in, in order to, a palette which is just ready uh, or, or or if you've had experience of working with designers and whether that's part of the process as well. Oh my goodness, like comment? To... Yeah. Um, what you try to do with the design of visuals is decrease the cognitive load on people, the amount of work they have to do to interpret what it is. So that's why you use align colours that align with common uses and um, 
organize things that uh, you know in a timeline and format consistent with what people expect because you're leveraging what they already know. One broader way to think about this that I've found useful is that what you're engaged in is conceptual tool making. Whatever you're doing with the data, the actual interface with the yourself and other people is this interface and that's um, the conceptual tool with the effectiveness of that tool is really important. Jane, what about um, your, your visualizations? Is that what's what's the working process there? Are you kind of taking things off the shelf and working yeah. with them or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, I'll jump, jump in quickly of there. Course, is, course, um, in there. Uh, I think that one of the big issues here is that we're working with um, uh, prepackaged software, and that 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 itself comes with its own expectations. And uh, at least in, in our lab, um, uh, we we talk a lot about that, and we talk about the idea that well, you know, if you're using Tableau, that's that's really being used by the advertising industry, and that has an issue. You know, that there's a meaning to that. Um, uh, one thing that is really interesting, for example, just in the dictionary is, of course, that, you know, Hannah and Lee have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about the user end, but, you know, the maps we're producing in, uh, you know, which are just using uh, ArcGIS Esri, you know, we're trying to make them look, look very drafty. Uh, we're not trying to actually make them look very good. Um, and, and, and we call them draft maps. Um, and the and the reason is to kind of point to point to that exploratory function, but also point to the weakness of the of the methods and the tools we're using. Um, you know, the, the the fact that it is about a kind of connection to a privatized economy uh, mm -hmm. that is different than what we might prefer. So, uh, so I, I do think that actually that is a really interesting question uh, of how we think about visualization and that intersecting with a kind of broader digital economy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 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 do do you do you see kind of futures being mapped out there? I'm particularly thinking, particularly thinking about kind of animation, and you know, we sort of quite a lot of kind of static images. And I think there were references to some of these things being being digitized and and kind of uh, uh, having a duration as well as as well as a kind of uh, uh, a kind of slide like quality. Is that something which is which is developing in your own areas or which you're utilizing yourselves? I'll note to you the area of uh, digital twins, which is emerging uh, in the corporate areas where they're trying to map a lot of different types of data onto, for example, a model of a business or a model of a race car. And the purpose of doing that is then people are aligned in their models and the data all fits together in a meaningful way that relates to the real world. Mm. And so that's a particularly powerful approach. Um, Picking up on what was said before, in the initial stages where you're exploring things, it's not terribly useful to um, refine things too much. You're just hunting for ideas. And perhaps it's at the presentation end where you put a fair bit more work into it that you be a bit more elaborate. Yeah. Yeah, I would just um, add to that that, uh, you know, just as significant as um, the, the visual effect, the visual impact. Um, of, of producing these data sets in the kind of uh, whatever forms we're producing them in, um, and in my instance, it's graphs, um, is the opportunity, uh, which is I'm working on at the moment, which is to, to make them interactive to some extent. I think that mm. part of the force of the visualization yeah. um, can be, or the force of the visualization can be harnessed and enhanced through, um, through allowing people interact with it themselves. Um, and, and to truly tease out the significance of the comparison between and amongst different um, different aspects of the chart. Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, we've got a, um, some questions lined up here, so we should start to move, move to them. Um, got a, a question po posted by uh, Lena Krause, um, and it's for the Dictionary of Art Historians team. Um, I'm very interested in the API and the reference to other authorities such as Wikidata. Uh, I tried the links on a few pro profiles, but they, they bring me to the an exemplary query with uh, Georgia Fasari, and I can't see the authority IDs in the JSON file. Um, I was wondering if you have mapped each person in your dictionary with the other authorities. I imagine it would include work contribute to uh, it would include work to contribute to Wikidata, since some art historians might not have a Wikidata node yet. For their example, are you interested in doing so? I can I can quite take technical. That yeah, yeah. Um, that's an excellent question um 
So um, the way that we currently have it set up um, is, is more in a one-way uh, uh, system where uh, folks who are looking at an entry on the dictionary uh, can do an automated search. So those links are automated searches of the other um, uh, resources. I will say I've noticed there's a bug. So if, it, uh, if you click on one and it's pulling up uh, an example entry, or it hasn't searched for the correct person, there's something that I'm working on there right now. So you've, you've hit on something that is a, a challenge with the recent launch, um, but the intention is that it will it will search for um, whichever art historian, um, the page that you're currently on. Um, as far as uh, uh, including IDs and connecting into Wikidata, that is an aspiration for the dictionary to actually have some of that um, data pulled in um, and directly available in the API. Um, it's not currently there. And um, we, we do anticipate that we would be and uh, contributing to some of these resources. Um, you'll notice, you know, some of the resources are limited. For example, the Archives of American Art is not necessarily going to have um, our European colleagues um, listed, but for things like Wikidata and, and perhaps WorldCat, there may be opportunities to to make suggestions. Um, that that was a core part of our partnership with the Getty Research Portal actually was um, as they were identifying uh, texts that they should digitize for the portal, uh, we were in conversation with them um, and sharing data uh, with them so that they could identify authors uh, to include. So um, that's something that, that um, we're hoping to work on in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Oh, Sarah's got a hand up. An actual hand, not even a digital real hand. hand. No, a real hand. At you. This isn't a, really a question because I'm just trying to um, shape some ideas, but I was just picking up on an idea that I think um, was presented by Paul right at the beginning. Um, the idea that doing this kind of work has the potential to focus or shine light on things that have been missed, perhaps, or left out of the grander narratives or conventional traditional forms of history writing, let's say. Paul, I'm probably kind of paraphrasing and, and reducing your arguments a lot here, but it just made me think about, uh, you know, and I think maybe we'll explore this in some of the later presentations as well, about whether mass data methodologies, part of the impetus or one of the very strong strands of this research is work, is kind of shifting the kind of conventional gaze of art history from the object or questions of aesthetics and uh, formal questions to uh, we, like just the things we've heard today about, well, people, institutions and networks, um, you know, sort of postal services, it, it's sort of <clears throat> shining a light on, you know, just some of the the the, the uncanonized of, of of history so it, it, again yeah. sorry it's not a question but it's just the thought about you know does mass data methodology have that potential to kind of um yeah honor things that have have been left out of conventional disciplinary structure is where i'm going with that i'll make a, a brief comment um yes i think it's really important that it does um there's a broader societal function to creativity and art and the increasing trend towards uh, technology and shifts in the careers that people are taking are going to challenge that in various ways. And you see that too with artificial intelligence, with uh, them creating artworks or music works or uh, authoring things. We need to understand and find ways for people to participate and understand their own uh, development in an artistic sense, quite apart from what the canon side of things is all about. And yes, there's very considerable uh, potential for that. I was thinking as well, like Anita as well, what you was, you know, the history of the Royal Academy isn't really written about exhibition length. <laughs> you know, it's about Joshua yeah. Reynolds and, you know, the sort of formation of national schools you know that's that's what's tended to come to the fore but I, I'm kind of interested in the kind of intersection of the the kind of yeah the more bureaucratic like the number of days the sales you know and actually the intersection of those with then writing about careers and and aesthetic choices of of artists so I wonder Anita if you want to just pick up on that as well 
Well, and I thought also just by dropping that data into different visualizations, it's then the possibility, and just by looking at those trends, using your eye to say, where are the outliers? Where's where's anomalies? And then to go back into the data and say, well, did this occur because there was a the the Royal Society made a change about who could exhibit? Was there something global in terms of, of course, you know, the non-academicians, there were less during, you know, wars. And if that's the case, maybe then the Royal Academy is engaged in broader rather than just looking at it within London and within the London um, kind of ecosystem of art history. And to Paul's point, I think the possibility of creativity with mass data to allow the public to interact with the data, I think is critical. Um, and I think Shane sort of referenced that. The other thing, I, the tool that I actually built for my PhD used Neo4j and it, and it visualises relationships between framers, artists and frame makers and that uncovered links that would have taken me years to find with my bits of paper everywhere. Like that was phenomenal in terms of visualising relationships and then I would go back using traditional art historical methodologies to follow up those links. Yeah. I mean, it's striking how already today there's been several points made about the, the, the need to keep different, both the kind of the, the established methodologies, the practical or the kind of analog te uh, de um, uh, uh, methodologies in dialogue with the technology as well. I mean, that, uh, several of you have said that already. Now, um, there's a, there was a question that was posted earlier on that can, uh, connects with this discussion a bit, but I see that Mia, um, Ming and Hans have hands up as well. So Ming, I think you were first. Thank you, Martin, and thank you everyone for those um, fascinating papers. Um, this ties in a little bit to what we'll be speaking in about in our paper as well. Um, so I won't sort of jump the gun here, but I'm wondering um, to what extent um, all of your work, and I'm addressing all of the speakers here, um, thinks about the question of um, bias in data structures and the, the bias that is embedded itself in the data which, you know, as we know, data is not a neutral category. Um, and so how, how do you um, contend with those issues in your work? Maybe I can jump in with, with <clears throat> one sort of obvious example. When we're con uh, covering women or art historians of color, they're not only are they documented less, but when they are documented, they have shorter entries. And so, we're in kind of a predicament. <clears throat> How do we fill in a lot of uh, places that are just missing from those people? And it's it's a concern. Uh, in some cases, we've been able to use our own knowledge or whatever to fill those things in. But in a, a lot of very uh, precise um, visualization, we do understand that there's some uh, bias there, that there's absence bias in the in the data. This actually does this does link to the question that I was kind of that was posted, and I can't. I think it's kind of got deleted now. But there's a very simple question. I, I'm kind of um, perhaps a kind of deceptively simple question for the dictionary of art historians, which was about: um, Do you do you cover independent art historians as well as people with institutional affiliations? But out of that, you can sort of gloss that to think: Well, how do you define an art historian? I mean, how are you creating your data set in the first instance? Uh, we come across this question a lot, and actually, we have a flexible definition <clears throat> for uh, groups that were excluded from the academy in many cases. We look at uh, their uh, effect on the public, their profile. Generally, we say if you published something that was art historical, you fit the first definition of what an art historian is. And for people who were, again, were prevented from, from doing much more than that, that's good enough for us. Um, the dictionary, I should say that the, the selection of, of uh, art historians is not our own. It's not our favorite art historians. Mm -hmm. We began with the four uh, major bibliographies, Coulterman and, and Bazin and, and things like that. And then as we wrote those entries, the people who were mentioned there, we filled it in that way. So um, while we have adjusted for the, the uh, minority uh, fields, <clears throat> basically it's self generating yeah because that it was it's so, it's so interesting to hear also with, with Shane where you're you know changing the criteria of how you create your data set can completely transform 
the overall historical picture um, in your case, if I, if I understood what you were, you were saying um, correctly. Um, there's ha Hans has got his hand up and then Rianne. Can I, so can I just, I just want to add one small thing to that, oh. Martin? Uh, one small thing, oh, and it yeah. goes back to your, your reference to white and white. Um, you know, this, this is not a new art historical problem. If you look at Vauflin's Principles of Art History, you will find a shocking number of paintings from the Alte Pinocotec in Munich. Why? Because that's walking down the street what he could see. So that was his data set, or, or at least obviously he was working more. I'm exaggerating. But so, so this is not a new problem that we have yeah. to deal with. Uh, and, and I think it's always, going back to Shane's comments, it's about, well, this is now a fundamental part of our method, just like knowing which which access we have to which collections yeah hands i think i think what i was yeah. going to ask is uh, very much pointing into the same direction because i was also struck by by shane's approach uh, where uh, you know drawing on completely different data sets changes the parameters substantially and that's exactly what i also saw as, as an interesting question for the dictionary um because um well, there are many art historians who literally have left probably no paper trail. British art historians, for example, who even taught at universities, but who have, for example, the UCO criterion, Lee, who have never published as an art historian, simply because that was the way that, you know, academia was structured at the time. Um, so I find it very interesting there to think about the frameworks that we impose on our work by the by, by something as simple as saying we're doing a dictionary, which uh, by definition is of course based around prosop uh, prosopographic approach, right? That we that we do look at individuals where we have at least a certain amount of data. Uh, whilst you could of course also source thinking about mass data, all the names from course syllabi or um, even student lists, um, people who, in depending on your definition, also count as art historians. But as I encounter in my work. Quite, quite regularly are, are virtually uh, you know not documented in other in any other meaningful way so I, i'm really interested in how the, the kind of um, the type of um the, the type of publication that we're tackling for example a dictionary also imposes a certain uh, um yeah a selective approach as to what data we mine primarily and it's very interesting i think to think about how to push the boundaries of something like a dictionary towards people that are yeah, literally undocumented, which yeah. you do have a lot actually in, in dictionaries of artists, you know, where it's uh, just say a name and then worked around 1739 or something like that. Yeah. Well, of course, and, 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 you know, defining an art story and you know, there are certain parameters. I mean, defining an artist is completely fraught almost by definition. I mean, is it about self-identification? Is it about exhibiting? Is it about making a living as an artist? Well, you know, <laughs> Re Rianne, you have your hand up as well, I think you're. Um, I was just going to go back to Ming's question, um, and basically my data set anyway, and I'll go into this in more detail about multiple scale methodologies. Um, my data set is based on stratified sampling across multiple institutions and resources for the exact reason that I wanted to mitigate previous problems with the data collection and with uh, institutional record keeping. But I have created an extensive appendix I don't ex expect my examiners to read so that if anyone wants to use the data set in the future, and I really hope they do, they can go back and critique it, expand on it. Like my, it, my data set is representative, it is certainly not exhaustive. And I think that's, um, I think it's really important that we bear in mind that whilst we're talking about these projects, um, that they can keep, we can keep getting more resources, sorry, more information from them, that actually they can all start interlinking and we can start seeing things from different perspectives but only if we question how that data has been gathered in the first place. Great. Uh, the, 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 there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. One of them I can see Sarah Turner is answering live, it looks like, which is a kind of technical question about the Chronicle 250. Um, but there's a question, again, for the, the Dictionary of Art Historians, but I guess it does kind of connect in with this issue about classification and categorization. It's from Laurel Zuckerman. Um, does the dictionary distinguish between Jewish and non-Jewish exiles from Nazi Germany? Uh, for instance, categories for Holocaust victims or Nazi party members? So quite a specific question, but I'll see. Yeah, and I think well. it does. We don't have fields for religion 
um, because it's tricky in many cases. But yeah. uh, if you're interested in this, you can do a keyword search with uh, Venlon and JEW, which gets Jew, Jewish, you know, whatever like that. And that should be a pretty discreet list, at least from Venlon, <clears throat> of who the, the uh, Jewish Holocaust victims were. And if you don't get that in the, the Vendlon one, those would probably be people who were uh, of, of other either religions or leftists, as Paul said. But that's also who we, that's that's a good example of how the the, the dictionaries itself are kind of jumping off point. So we went back to Vendlon and we pulled out Jewish, non-Jewish um, in order to make that distinction in our maps, um, you know, which then can lead back to questions of uh, the actual, say, Jewish art historians who are in then the dictionary itself. So, so it really is a two-way street there. Yeah, it leads you into um, essentially kind of fraught questions about identification and self-identification. Also, yeah. struck you know, you've got a got a fairly binary um, gender classification system in play, and of course, that's just, you know, there, 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 are, there, are, there can be questions about that in terms of um, um, perspectives on identity and and, and self-identification and, and self-understanding. I should say that the dictionary has multiple identification fields. It's not just binary. Well, I think it was male, female, or other, wasn't it? Or male, female, or not known. I thought we saw the. But that's that's what, that, that, as you say, there, there's a whole you know, range of ways of, of, of searching. Okay. Do, do we have? Um, I think something else can just come in from um, Sally Woodcock. Oh, hello, Sally. Um, Apologies for a rather nuts and bolts question. I don't think you need to, in this context, if, if, if any context, I don't think you need to apologize for a nuts and bolts question. Um, in the early 1990s, I used a relational database called Idealist, which for its time had unusually sophisticated search mechanisms, but also turned out to have dreadful data exporting importing. It is long obsolete, but I still regularly use it for a data set of about 9,000 artists. I've been trying to find a replacement that is available offline picture stores where I sometimes work usually have no internet access. I did look at Airtable mentioned by the speakers, but it appears to be um, online only. Can anyone suggest a database that is capable of holding large text fields and working with dates and numbers, which doesn't always need an internet connection? Many thanks. So actually an interesting, uh, I'm gonna make some point as well about how dependent we are on, on kind of online resources as well now, but um, Rianne, you have your hand straight up as if you may have an answer or a response. Yeah, well, um, if my, I used Microsoft Access for mine, it does require you obviously importing all the data and the relationships, um, but it was quite straightforward. I mean, admittedly, I do use mine online because I use mine remotely through my university because I use a Mac and Access isn't available on Mac, um, but that worked pretty well for me because I had a similar concern that if I was too reliant on the internet, would I would I be caught out? And also, would I ever be able to download the scale of the data set? This is before I knew about all the tech available, um, but it was also free for me to access. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend, um, it does have its, it sometimes has, it has its limitations, but um, if once you know, get familiar with it, it's great. And um, my university anyway, provided a whole handbook on how to build my data set and gave me training sessions and stuff. So always willing to pass along that information if one needs it. And uh, Hannah as well, I think you've got your hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think that's all excellent. Um, just to speak to an alternative to Airtable, there's an open source project called Base Row, and I'll put the link in the chat that uh, has created something that is very similar to Airtable. And because it is open source, you can choose whether or not to run it um, online or actually just host it on your own computer. So um if um folks are interested in alternatives to Airtable, that is there i mean after that comes over comes a more a more general question for the for the panel um particularly the panel who have panel members who are primarily art historians or, or historians by training which is um how do you get the technical know-how <laughs> To produce to generate this these data and these these visualizations, is it, I mean, do, do, is there is there access to training? Um, do, do you just kind of find your own way? Well, through a university, um, they have a remarkable amount of um, training available for PhD students, and also I think it's about showing initiative to walk across campus to, you know, the 
computational um, areas and it actually allows you to take different subjects. So for example, you can take, I actually think it should be compulsory for art historians in first year to be able to take undertake some kind of computational software learning. Uh, the challenge that we have in our art historical discipline is that the professors look at something and press print and you will have been into many a professorial office which is full of books and lots of drawers with files in it and so that older generation is and the and the idea of the connoisseur is not linked to using digital technologies as part of the research mm. but yes uh, within an educational institution there's a remarkable amount available there's also quite a lot online if you're proactive mm. Yeah, Duke University, I was going to say Duke University Libraries has a data visualization lab <clears throat> that anybody can come in and uh, play with the software. They don't do the projects for you, but they have experts there who can <clears throat> suggest software and uh, show you how to use it. <clears throat> Rianne, yeah. Um, yeah, just um, I was similar that I had to do a lot of cold calling. It was exhausting in the first year because um, I had my idea for my methodology and I didn't want to compromise my methodology by not being able to access the resources. And again, I mentioned this in my talk about the fact that I didn't have funding to build software. I had to use everything that's free and available remotely. Um, sorry, my dog wants to say hello. Um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I had to physically... Uh, in some cases, go to other members of staff and other departments and kind of beg for their time. And obviously, they're stressed in their own capacities. So I went to geography, for example, for GIS support. Um, but also, I went to other, institu other institutions like British Library DigiLabs. And again, just begged for help. I was not one of their funded students. Um, so I think it'd be really interesting later to consider what resources we can pull or pull together from these discussions to ensure mm -hmm. that other students don't have to be in such awkward positions because I found it quite intimidating um, to go into to a sort who was new to these institutions to have to go and beg, borrow and steal for these resources. Um, but then once people which got through the door, people were more than willing to help. Great. And, and Shane, over to you. And then there's a question lined up for you as well. So, um... yeah, I just wanted to add briefly, uh, you know, at its most basic level, obviously, it, engaging with these um, methodologies is, is no different to engaging in any kind of new area of exploration but i agree with with, with with what you're saying about it being more um intimidating and i th and i think that um what paul uh wilson was saying about this idea of starting small and, and doing it incrementally and taking it step by step um is um and using the uh, as rian said the, the kind of resources that are initially available to you online um i think this is a really effective um approach to getting to the more complex things because when you see these mass visualizations initially um there's a there's a, there is a certain amount of intimidation about them and you it is you do struggle to conceive of how you get from where you are right now to to a much more um, complex kind of visualization um and but i think it's the same kind of slow intellectual building that we do when we investigate any new area just at its most basic level mm -hmm. maybe hannah yeah you have your hand back then i've, I've, I've got a, a question for shane you might come back there yeah, absolutely. So I'm I'm uh, not an art historian, um, and I will just say that um, one thing I would emphasize here too is um, collaboration and seeking out um, partners, and that can look like the kinds of consultations that have already been described, right? Uh, universities that have those kinds of um, resources available. There are also plenty of workshops and institutes that are held around the world, um, some online, some in person. Um, and some that have funding schemes that um, are great, both in terms of, of gaining skills, but also in terms of building community and looking for, for potential collaborators. Um, and that that's something that I, I highly encourage folks to, to do. Great. Okay, um, there's a question posted here for, for Shane. I think looking at the time, this, this may draw us to a close for this, this session, but it's posted by um, Lena Krause and a uh, question for Shane. Uh, could you tell us more about your methodology to gather your data, did you automate some of the extraction from the digitized reports? Uh, that's an uh, that's an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, the the OCR on the uh, on the digitized reports um, and the nature of the way that they're laid out uh, 
meant it was kind of not not possible to extract them in any kind of efficient way that um it, i had to go through them each individually and pull them out and, and a second impediment to that was that every time a new postmaster general is appointed they seem to decide to reformat the report so uh, and that's part of the reason why some of the data drops out uh in 1913 so there was no, there was nothing sta sufficiently standardized about it to enable me um, to even start thinking about how I might do it at at, at scale or or using um, anything other than the most rudimentary yeah. log approach for that. Fortunately, okay. Well, th th thank you for that, and I think it kind of nicely illustrates how um, already today we're getting that sense of how these kind of details of the archive the detail of of, of of methodology kind of actually open up and kind of can transform your methodology in, in in quite in quite dramatic ways that um as well as that dialogue between between different methods kind of established methods and 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 new methods which are facilitated by technology um we are uh, running up to um our break which i think is our kind of we, we, it's not billed as a lunch break because we're not providing you with lunch. But um, it's that time of day, I think. Um, and uh, it's been such a fantastically rich and stimulating, stimulating session already with uh, such a, a, a range of approaches and, and questions arising out of it. I know the um, conversation is going to continue um, with this afternoon's panel and then with um, Hans' um, uh, contribution towards the end as well, which is going to, I think, offer some more kind of historiographical reflections uh, and, and, and conversation coming out of that. So uh, for now, I think um, you could join me in uh, thanking through our virtual applause uh, and various expressions and gestures, um, uh, thanking all our panelists this morning, Anita and Paul, Shane, Hannah, Paul uh, and Lee. Um, thank you so much. And we will return um, at uh, 2.15, but for now, Round of applause. And do check the chat as well. There are various um, notes and suggestions and links posted in the chat for your reference as well. But otherwise, do um, enjoy your 30 minute break or so, and we will see you um, back in the room at 2.15.
ja. I've sort of a half joke before. I'm sure that sure there must be some way of um, getting sandwiches delivered to people's homes during breaks and online sessions but we'd have to do a menu of options wouldn't we for like breakfast mm. options for the u.s oh, yes, of course yeah time zones yeah australia yeah. i know and neat for anita and paula i think it's some pretty unearthly hour anita what time are you on uh tasmania it's quarter past one in the morning oh my goodness Damn thought I think that's like Horlicks or Martini, depending on your vibe. Yeah, I was about to say, hold the sandwich, send the, at this stage, probably sugar. <laughs> yeah, like towards, yeah re a really chewy black coffee. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> mm. Yeah. No, I have to say, things like this is certainly one of the silver linings from COVID. Oh, right. being able to connect up around the globe like this. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, yeah, different world. Oh, next time you have one of these events, have Anita show you some of her other work. She's done some really amazing things with Neo4j. It's well worth a look. <laughs> That's you, collaboration in action, isn't it? That's it is. like... But but do 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 keep posting. I, I see there's quite a lot posted in the chat. I think people do do take note, and you know they really kind of appreciate the chance to you know see any links, anything that you posted, anything you put up. Anyway, people are coming back in. Well, I, I think I'm noticing it's two fifteen. So, and it looks as though we have most of us back from. Our break. I hope everyone had a good, a good, uh, yeah, kind of refreshing, tasty break uh, and lunch. And it's nice to see you all again. Um, so we're kicking off our second panel in the Mass Data Methodologies Workshop today. Uh, I'll be chairing this panel. My name is Bailey Card, and I work at the Paul Mellon Centre as an editor of open access uh, online publications. And some of those have been mentioned already, such as our journal British Art Studies. And as Sarah said, we really see those publications as kind of testing grounds for exploring how work using these kinds of methodologies can, can be shared and, and communicated. So it's been an amazing workshop so far, and I'm really looking forward to the series of, of papers that we have coming up. Um, I've been told that I don't need to run through the kind of Zoom housekeeping again, which is great, but just for anybody uh, listening, just to be aware that you can um, share questions at any time through the Q&A button. Um, you also can share messages in the chat and those will be visible to everyone and, and you can just kind of comment on that at any, any point. Uh, and you can also raise your hand if you would like to be called on to ask a, a question for yourself. Um, but I'll dive kind of right into our, our first paper and, and introduce our first speaker. So we have Rian Addison McCreener, who is an AHRC collaborative PhD student between the University of York and Tate Britain, and was formerly curator of historic fine art at the Whitworth University of Manchester. And she will be sharing her paper, Multiscalar Mixed Methodologies, Rediscovering Landscape Artist Studios. And just note that's a different title than we had listed on our uh, event, which I think is incorrect, but that, that is the correct title. So thank you, Rian, take it away. Hi, thank you. Um, oh, I'm just sorry, I'm just rejigging screens to make sure I can see everything. <laughs> so my thesis, Indoor Spaces for Outdoor Minds, Landscape Artist Studios, 1780 to 1850, explores the irony that raw landscapes were being painted in, the, in urban London. The outside world was being created inside the limits of a room. When scholarship has considered the studio come galleries of landscape artists, it has been predominantly through monographic fo monographs focusing on less than 20 artists, eclipsing the wider landscape artist population and skewing our understanding of their production of landscape paintings and how we interpret them today. To have a clear understanding of the landscape artist's urban experience, I applied multi-scalar mixed methodologies starting with the landscape artist community on a macro level and metaphorically speaking, zooming into the studio. I will discuss the multi-scalar methodology a little later, but first I want to focus on the mass data aspect, which formed the foundation for my research. So why use mass data methodologies? Some people have already touched it, um, on it already. 
As Martin Myrone and Diana Greenwald have each discussed, mass data sets will consist of art or artists which are not perceived as masterpieces or did not attain celebrity status. However, their presence provides a wider social context and thus art historical context. Arguably the greatest social context that data sets provide is a seemingly more democratic, non-hierarchical overview of artists' populations. Paris Spies Gans has argued that this requires a willingness to use qualitative data and qualitative data approaches to address the idea that a canon is flawed when it fails to truthfully represent the period it aims to embody. Thus, in order to have a more accurate understanding of the landscape community, I needed to create a database which set aside previous scholarship, stepped back to look at the breadth of the community, and returned to primary evidence where possible. For a macro perspective of the landscape artist population, I built a database and GIS map, which you can see, see a brief overview on the screen here. The database holds details of around 2,700 landscape artists at around 6,550 addresses. This data goes well beyond the numbers that current scholarship implies, not only establishing where the studios were located, but revealed how prolific the genre was and exposed a neglected artistic community. Using stratified sampling, that is a strict set of parameters, I collated the data from exhibition catalogues and London directories, which listed artists' addresses. Using stratified sampling allowed for cross-sampling of the data from multiple institutions, which could be compared to provide a more comprehensive data set and clarify errors and contradictions. It also mitigated but does not eradicate institutional biases and resets the reliability and validity in the data. And it also allowed, for, as we've mentioned before, crossographical analysis, reconstructing the landscape artist community using accumulation of scarce data. In short, the stratified, stratified sampling ensured that whether previously overlooked, unsuccessful, professional, or amateur by their own definition, each person sits equally in the database as a landscape artist. Critically embracing advanced technologies has allowed for the social interpretation of data, which was not possible in previous scholarship. This included identifying clusters of addresses, the proximity of landscape artists to one another, and making queries by location to show the geographic significance of the urban studio on the creation of a landscape work. So I'm now going to show you a brief video demonstrating the database and map. I've deliberately pre-recorded this to hopefully um, sure that there's no lag or anything. So here we go. The database was built in Microsoft Access, which allows for the creation of different tables which form relationships, as well as being able to export the data to statistical analysis. Here you can see an overview of the six tables. They each link according to a key field. So for example, every artist, address and source was designated a unique ID number to prevent duplications. This means that an artist can have multiple addresses and each address can have multiple source, address can have multiple sources. On the left panel, you can see six tables. From these tables, I could then create queries, which are listed below. Queries draw specific fields to create another table, which you can then use for calculations and filters, depending on your question. The table one, artists, holds immediate information about the artist that are unique identifiers. Table two, artist addresses, allows for artists to have multiple addresses, their unique ID number corresponding with geotagging on the map, which I will come to. Table three, address dates, allows us to track the order in which artists were at, at any given property and accounts for the returning to addresses on multiple occasions. And then uh, the other tables four and five are a bit about institutions and suppliers. And table six, sources, does exactly what it says on the tin, and was essential for clarifying contradictions in the data. It also ensured internal validity that someone else could replicate the same findings in the future. Let's look at an existing query. Here, what I'm about to bring up are the London addresses for John Constable, which I extracted from a case study. His artist ID is for number 105, which is linked to multiple address IDs. The address dates have also been pulled through to the query, allowing me to filter in order of occupation. I then took the query further. Constable lived at, on Charlotte Street Fitzroger twice in his career, firstly at number 63 and later at number 35. To establish his interactions with other landscape artists, I created queries for the street and for the two separate time periods. So here, for example, we can see the other landscape artists living on Charlotte Street when Constable was living at number 35. Caution must be applied, however. This is where technical and historical knowledge is required to interpret the data. Although these artists are listed on Charlotte Street, 
there were numerous iterations of Charlotte Street throughout Fitzrovia. So if we cross-reference these artists with the accurately mapped ones of Fitzrovia, it filters down to considerably less, as we shall see in a moment. So whilst the database contains over another hundred artists on the Charlotte Street, we can't be certain that this is the correct Charlotte Street. Oh, oh dear, I apologize. I've just mixed, messed up my own video. Start that again. <laughs> I built the map using open source software QGIS. The purpose of the map is to be able to, I've got a picture of my son in background. The purpose of the map is to be able to process the vast number of addresses and place them in a visual context known as a meta image. This allows for a greater understanding of the locations of landscape artist studios and their proximity to institutions, other locations, and provide real life information such as walking times between locations. Here is an overview of all the landscape artist addresses between 1780 and 1850. My main source for this thesis is Richard Horwood's Plan of the Cities of London, created from 1792 to 99. Horwood's map is the earliest to list house numbers in London, thus allowing the marking of the locations to be as accurate as possible, period. The metropolis expanded exponentially between 1799 and 1850, so I overlaid B.R. Davies' 1843 map of London to create a visual parameter of the city. I also used OpenStreetMap, so that's VR Davies in a bit more detail, and I used OpenStreetMap for a 21st century perspective. Forward's map was geo-referenced um, by several other people, I, must, I can't take credit for that, uh, using surviving monuments and road junctions to align with the real world map. Although the alignment is detailed, we must consider that multiple layers, which have been hand-drawn, will contain elements of human error or artistic license. The maps have been digitally warped to accommodate the slight variations from the modern open street map. So the location of a street map on Horwood's map may be 50 metres west of where it is in real life, for example. On the left panel, you can also see the data files. The map works in tandem with the database. Each layer of the data points can be, have an attribute table attached, which in my case contains a brief amount of information which corresponds to the database. So for example, this is all the addresses of female landscape artists and it should bring up their attribute table now, which includes their address ID and artist ID. I then imported additional information from the database, such as their names. As with the database, you can use filters to ask queries and save them on different layers. You can filter the data or select points on the map. So for example, here I'm going to show how I can select using a polygon around Soho Square. Or, apparently my brain's working faster than my video. <laughs> so these are just the artists highlighted in yellow there. Um, or here I can instruct QGIS to filter the data according to the density of a population using a heaps map. It was also possible to go back to the database and extract more information about the addresses and build an understanding of relationships with where the artists lived. So here are all the artists for whom it was clear they lived on Charlotte Street for Tarobia, which I'll explore again more in a moment. Now to the realities of executing such research. I've thoroughly enjoyed collating data and exploring research threads that I'd never imagined would emerge. However, I face a lot of challenges. I face objections from within my own department as to whether the use of mass data was art history, but rather sociology. As Martin Myrone has argued in Making Modern Artists, oh, Martin was formerly my supervisor, by the way. <laughs> art history does not exist without sociology, and such a social context can be facilitated by large scale data sets. When I started I, five, five years ago, I found there was a, a disparate information on how to collate the data, but since, um, since then, huge technological and scholarly leaps have been made with the likes of Layers of London being open to access and the publication of the Rutledge Companion to Digital Humanities and Art History. There is the challenge of accurately interpreting the data, which is why it's important to have a fully functioning platform. For example, I had to play around for a lot of time with Microsoft Access as to how to filter things by time period and the technical and historical knowledge to interpret that data. Initially, I struggled to find training and technical support, and it, but I did manage it in the end. And I needed training to use the likes of Python, OpenRefine, Microsoft Access, and GIS platforms. My, I was probably too ambitious, to be honest. 
A big challenge was executing the research with no project funding, uh, but I adapted my approach so that I only used uh, free open source software. However, in their present format, neither the database or map are publicly accessible. Because mass data hasn't been embraced in art, histori art history until recently, projects are often on different platforms, making comparison more challenging, or they have different criteria for collating data and thus aren't strictly comparable. So I'd really be interested in seeing how we could all work together together to draw our projects to make comparisons. Whilst these may seem like negative points, really I'm highlighting them because I'm so enthusiastic to iron these things out for other people. So mass data was only one third of my methodology, providing a macro perspective of the landscape artist community. The database could not account for the context of an artwork's creation or production of, or its cultural significance. To redress this imbalance, the second stage of my research zooms in on a meso level that is looking at a cross-section of the landscape artist community through four case studies, John Constable being one of them. The third stage of my research zooms into the micro level of the studio, using qualitative material to understand the activity that occurred within and molded the landscape artist studio. Adopting a multi-scalar mixed methodology was beneficial for three reasons. Firstly, the prosographical approach, using the scarce amount of data cumulatively. The second advantage of the significance of location was retained at every level of analysis keep the locations in relation to landscape production and at the forefront of my analysis. And finally, the mixed methodology allowed me to simultaneously ask questions of the overall landscape arts community and the individual experience. The macro data would just be statistics if it wasn't contextualized by the qualitative data. Likewise, the macro data provided an overview of the landscape arts community, um, but the meso and micro analysis would have mirrored previous monographic scholarship, which provides a limited context for the wider production of their works. The findings of my research defies the institutional narrative that there are only a handful of successful landscape artists and has revealed landscape the different communities within the landscape artist population, particularly female landscape artists who scantily feature in literature. In short, this methodology provides an enhanced macro view that demonstrates the possibilities of alternative narratives that can be drawn from mass data and GIS resources. So I'm now going to briefly present a case study to demonstrate the value in the multi-scale methodology. Charlotte Street Fitzrovia has always been noted as a popular street for artists. However, there has never been a macro analysis of who passed through the street or the significance of the genre. I've mapped 23 landscape artists who resided on Charlotte Street. Charlotte Street offered cheap rooms, where, which were ideal if the landscape artists were visiting for the exhibition season. However, at the other end of the scale, artists who were wealthy by independent means, such as Joseph Farrington, would build extensions to accommodate their practice. Brownton lived at 35 Charlotte Street for 39 years, which was highly unusual for a landscape artist. So the data collection was really important for reflecting the reality of how landscape artists typically occupied numerous lodgings in London throughout their career. Situated almost opposite Brownton's property was number 63. The first landscape artist we are aware of lodging here is George Morland. Morland's notorious lifestyle of drinking and debt has prevailed in art, history, art historical memory, more so than his art. By 1792, Morland was legally bound to pay his creditors £120 per month to consolidate his debts and was housed at 63 Charlotte Street. It was described as an elegant house with a garden, coach house and stables. When Morland, I'll go back to the artist, when Morland occupied the house, there were four other landscape artists on the street, including Francis Wheatley, with whom Morland, he had had published numerous prints throughout his career. In the same year as movie did Charlotte Street, Morland exhibited an astronomical 15 works at the Royal Academy. He reduced his canvas sizes to increase productivity, but he sees he made some exceptions to attract attention. The benevolent sportsman, pictured here, was one of the largest works ever painted at Charlotte Street and was reportedly executed in about a week to assure it was ready for exhibition. A bit of an exaggeration, I can imagine. 17 years later, in 1811, John Constable would move into number 63. Whereas Morland had had the whole property, Constable leased rooms on the first floor above the cabinet maker and upholsterer Richard Waite. Constable requested that the back drawing room would be painted salmon with crimson upholstered furniture. Constable himself was a different about show, though all insisted upon it, reassuring himself that the colours will suit the pictures that he wanted to display. Constable's studio was the first floor front room, likely the space used by Morland, which had the slightest advantage of northeasterly light. He instructed the studio to be painted with a sort of purple brown from the floor to ceiling, not sparing even the doors or doorposts for white is disagreeable to a painter's eyes near pictures. 
arguably Cotswold's wall colour was strategic to create a neutral environment to not influence the palette of his works. However, in February 1814, he was struggling to add warmth to a plowing scene in Suffolk. The studio, the studio would not have been had the ideal lighting conditions due to the combination of the purple brown walls and the London winter. And able to resolve the issues in the confines of the studio, Cotswold pledged he would prepare an on plane air oil sketch from then on. There are no surviving images of 63 Charlotte Street or its interior, but fortuitously, the landscape artist and figure painter William James Muller drew the inside of his studio at 22 Charlotte Street. On the east side of the street, Muller's first floor room the studio would have had less light than Moreland Constable. In this confidence sketch here, Muller places an emphasis on the context of the room. And whilst it was likely that Muller had several rooms to live in, this sketch shows the limited studio space an artist on Charlotte Street realistically had. Though this is a very brief and focused example, the database and map revealed relationships and circumstances that would not otherwise be possible without mass data. However, the data was only contextualized as part of the multi-scalar mixed methodology that allows us to understand how a location could shape a landscape painting. There are far more questions that can be asked of this data set. If we consider the number of landscape artists identified in the database, around 2,700 exhibiting over a 70 year period, then it's possible to imagine the burgeoning activity that was occurring within their studios and how many more are waiting to be uncovered. I designed this research to have a life well beyond my thesis. My methodology was designed to ensure internal validity, that is the process can be rep replicated to generate the same results, as well as external validity, so the methodology could be applied to artist studios of other genres to allow for direct comparison. I would like the database and map to become publicly accessible and user friendly. The data itself will also be contributing towards collaborative research, such as the British Art Network's Mapping British Women Artists project. So looking to the future, mass data could be utilised to look across time periods, artistic genres and material practices, to name a few. But I would argue that embracing multi-scalar mixed methodologies and advancing technologies are essential to art history if we wish to expose forgotten artistic communities from little surviving material. Um, I welcome anyone to get in touch to discuss my methodologies and resources I've used. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rian. That was so interesting. And I think it, it speaks really brilliantly to some of the questions we had in the first panel about the kind of nuts and bolts of how people are working and connecting it through to specific examples of, of mixed forms of analysis. So yeah, thank you. And it will be great to, to discuss your paper more in, in the q and I'm going to introduce uh, our second paper now, which um, is being given by a team of researchers who have very cleverly coordinated Zoom backgrounds. Um, I'll introduce Ming Tianpo, who is Professor of Art History and Co-Director of the Center for Transnational Cultural Analysis at Carleton University. Panzi Atta, an Egyptian-Canadian visual artist, curator and researcher living and working on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation in Ottawa. Yannicke Van Hoeve, is pursuing uh, her MA in art history and, or sorry, art and architectural history with a specialization in digital humanities at Carleton University and Maribel Hidalgo Urbaneja, who is Worlding Public Culture's postdoctoral research fellow at the Chelsea College of Arts at the University of the Arts London. And their paper is Mobile Subjects, Contrapuntal Modernisms. Thank you so much, Bailey. Um, are you able to hear me and see me? Hello? Yes, that's great. great. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, first, just wanted to thank uh, the Paul Mellon Center, uh, Sarah Turner, Mar Mar Martin Myron, Danny Conby, and Bailey Card um, for pulling this all together. It's really um, such a pleasure to be in this context. Uh, so reflecting the importance of collaboration to data-driven work and also to global art history from a pluriversal perspective, um, which I call worlding, we are presenting in a team of four today, um, although we're just um, four of um, a much larger team, which represents the digital side of this much larger of these much larger collaborations. Um, so I'll be speaking first, followed by Panzi Atta, then Janneke van Hove, and um, finally, Maribel Hidalgo Urbaneja. Mobile subjects, contrapuntal modernisms investigates the circulation of artists from the decolonizing world through the colonial and artistic capitals of London and Paris. 
this tale of two cities, considers how these capitals of decolonizing empires functioned as critical meeting places, anti-colonial hubs, and sites of exchange in the decades after World War II due to post-war mass migration. It considers how these mobile subjects, artists from Asia, Africa, and Latin America, relocated to the different immigration contexts of London and Paris, facilitated by scholarships, educational opportunities, exhibitions, and journals. It furthermore seeks to make visible the transcultural artistic practices, communities, networks, discourses, solidarities, and worlds that artists co-constituted through, between, and in these capitals, as well as their impacts on regional histories of modern art. The purpose of this project is to propose a new analytical model that sees metropoles not as points of origin or as global training grounds for artists from the global south, but as spaces of intersection and flow that allow us to understand the transnational condition of modern art and the co-constitution of modernism. In order to do this, it is not enough to rely upon the traditional methods of art history, nor on any one individual's inter, inter expertise and data sets. So here, as Paris Spies Gans argues about women artists in the 18th and 19th centuries, it is necessary to demonstrate that these artists from the global south in London and Paris were quote, exceptional, but not exceptions. The project thus uses data science to connect scholars and their existing data sets through a collaborative database and workshops that map and investigate the presence of overseas artists in London from 1945 to 1989 and Paris from 1900 to 1989. Working collaboratively, and our team is much bigger than just us, um, we are experimenting with artistic visualizations, engaging with issues of decolonizing data ontologies and database structures, and are now working to bring it all together in a critical database and data visualization, which we will demonstrate later. As Diana Sieve Greenwald argues in her book, Painting by Numbers, data science is only one tool in our analytical toolbox, which our team uses as a starting point for art historical and interdisciplinary methods that range from formal analysis and slow looking to post-colonial and decolonial theory global microhistory, global urban history, and worlding. As one part of our larger methodology, data provides a macro view, something that we've um, heard many times today, allowing us to zoom out to see patterns and connections before zooming in again to look closely with fresh eyes, able to see beyond the disciplinary assumptions of art historical inquiry. And this is very similar to what Rian just um, presented earlier on multi-scalar mixed methodology. So I think, I think we have lots to talk about there. So what I'm showing you here in the slide is an example of what our colleague and team member, Michelle Greet did with her website and book, Transatlantic Encounters, Latin American Artists in Paris Between the Wars. And so she has a book, which is much more sort of traditional piece of art history, and also this website, which I'm showing you on the right-hand side. And um, here is a um, similar pairing of more traditional scholarship and di digital methods in a collaborative article and archive feature, Slade London Asia, that I created with Liz Bruchet in British Art Studies. And I'll put the links in the chat later. So using a large data set as a starting point, the article in British Art Studies addressed large movements and trends and also zoomed in to explore micro histories, such as what the ways in which artists from decolonizing contexts went on to establish and consolidate art institutions in the global south in critical dialogue with their time at the slate. So that's just one example of the, the smaller micro stories, the micro histories that we presented in the context of this larger macro history in British art studies. So now I'm just going to hand it over to my colleague, Pansy. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ming. Um, so uh, one way, one way okay, that we've uh, sought to visualize these concepts is through uh, this animation, uh, tracing the movement of international artists to the slave school of fine arts through the mid 20th century. 
Uh, unlike the standard Mercator projection, which is typically used to visualize the globe, uh, this map uh, is centered on the Pacific rather than on Greenwich. This draws attention to the global span uh, of these artists' networks, shifting London from the center to the margins while keeping the relationship between the continents familiar enough to remain legible. At the same time, geopolitical borders are rendered as organic, porous, indeterminate charcoal lines, making visible a semblance of their social and political presence, as well as their volatility over the course of this time period. Uh, similarly, the paths uh, denoting the artist's movements are sketchy, indefinite, multiple. Their lines produce a geographic and temporal network that is transiently interlinked through sharp digital artifacts that branch out across the map's clusters. Animated using blenders, open, uh, open source robust tools, each of the path's uh, visual characteristics, um, their opacity, their texture, their visual noise, can be generatively mapped onto the data set's variables, encoding seemingly decorative visual qualities with quantitative or qualitative meaning. Accordingly, uh, this work reflects and reproduces the project's analytical methodology. While we know the artists' national origins and their destinations, uh, we cannot be certain of their routes or the multitude of possible connections they may have made along the way. The materiality of this visualization um, puts into practice a decolonizing approach to mass data methodology by making space for multiplicity and uncertainty in analyses of the global, telling a story about the numbers that accounts for the indeterminacy of the human. Uh, and now over to Yannicka's work. Thanks, Pansy. Okay, so what we're looking at here, at its core, this network model shows approximate connections that existed between racialized artists. Beyond this, the model can help us identify new insights and evidence. It can help us identify blind spots as described by Johanna Drucker in our data, particularly in areas that have been historically overlooked. This static view does not tell us much other than reaffirming the fact that there was a massive network of non-Western artists active between Paris and London throughout the 1900s. The colors are coded by country of birth and there is a dot or node representing each artist and a second node connected by a line for each connection point or institution, exhibition or gallery that an artist was involved with. In total, there are 3,073 artists in 2,993 connecting lines within this network. Next slide, please, Mink. So when hovering over an artist, a box will pop up with more detailed information. We are mindful of the gaps in our data, as indicated by the question marks beside the fields that we do not have information for. From here, we can also identify some major clusters within our data, including La Cité Internationale and Slade School. Next slide, please. And we're playing a video here without sound. So to develop a better understanding of the stories buried within this network, we need to dig deeper into the layers. A further step we have taken is to prepare a second version of this network with a time-based animation to visualize how this web of associations fluctuated and evolved. As you can see, the network builds over time with new connections each year being represented by the colored lines coded by country. We could also isolate a specific time frame or country of birth using filters or seeing individuals' connections changing over time within this network. And I'll give it a minute to finish playing here. I talked a little bit too fast for this video. So connections are still building over time and eventually we're going to end up with a view that shows us at the end of the 1900s or the midpoint the amount of connections within our network. Okay, next slide, please, Mink. Another filter we can use to dig deeper into this data is filtering by specific connection point. So this static network includes the same information about artists who studied at the Slade School that Pansy just presented in her animation. We can see all the artists who had an affiliation with the Slade School over a span of roughly 80 years, which still does not tell us much about the possible connections between artists. 
our next steps will be to create more flexible code-based models of the data that resonate with the uncertain and inconsistent nature of the histories we are working with. This data contains gaps, ambiguities, and multiple meanings that situates these histories in a fluid rather than final position. Over to Maribel. Uh, thank you, Jenica. Um, adopting a quantitative methodology, in, in our case, uh, responds to the need of a question in stereotypes and assumptions, uh, which is a principle that guides data-centric digital humanities methods. And this approach answers questions that require evidence of a different scale of com and complexity than traditional art history uh, uh, challenges um, monographic studies. But in addition to this, key to our project is a critical intervention of our methods. In dialogue with the decolonizing data research cluster of the World in Public Cultures project, mobile subjects, contrapuntal modernisms, is engaged in a critical interrogation of data-centric methods. If you're curious about the World in Public Cultures project and, and also about the work we've been doing um, in, around the CDOC CRM ontology, uh, you can visit the, the two links on, on the slides. Um, um, the critical nature of our approach uh, is, is leading us to, up, to adopt post-colonial and decolonial digital humanities strategies and practices that respond to the fact that, as Rupi Karisan argues, cultural canons are being reproduced and amplified not only in the visibility and discoverability of knowledge, but also in epistemologies of digital knowledge production. The adoption of well-established and universally recognized methods that are often seen as neutral by a wide portion of the community is considered good practice as it facilitates a change of information. But the truth is that they reinforce existing power dynamics and knowledge biases. So in response to these issues, and I'm quoting uh, Rupika's recent uh, work again, Postcolonial approaches to digital humanities intervene gaps and omissions by engaging with the politics of representation and look beyond representation to develop design practices that lay bare the politics surrounding digital knowledge production. Accordingly, our aim is to address gaps and omissions in terms of artist representation, as well as to rethink digital knowledge production and epistemologies um, as we develop the project database and data visualizations that uh, accommodate uh, artists. Next, next slide, please. Uh, in, in particular, and concerning data visualization, we found ourselves engaged responding to the idea that mod modeling data into a graphical expression, uh, such as a visualization, is a form of knowledge production and a form of interpretation. Namely, and in connection to the visualizations my, my colleagues Pansy and Janaka have just shown, um, Johanna Drucker states that um, maps are a record of exploration, classic and tactile, narrative and immersive when created in, uh, from inside the experience of discovery, but rationalized through projection when produced from outside as images. The complexity of representing a curved form on a flat surface, as well as the many cultural imperialisms and work, provide their own history within the range of projection methods. And then about network diagrams, um, and they assume an absolute distinction between nodes and the edges that connect them, and their display is organized by algorithms that optimize display rather than following strict interpretation of their relationships between, among the nodes. The visual arrangement cannot be read as an accurate representation of information, only as an approximation. Next slide, please. Um, we would like to finish our presentation with a reflection on the next steps that follow critique and, and acknowledgement of, of um, and epistemologies and, and, and knowledge production. Um, and we would like to share with all of you the following questions, which are guiding our process of rethinking and redesigning the database and data visualizations model we use. And, and these questions are, can we decolonize data-centric methodologies? How can data methodologies be reimagined to render complex histories and identities and to surface horizontal relationships? 
how can we challenge dominant models for data visualiza visualization that have been built upon colonial and Western epistemologies? How can we express uncertainty, ambiguity, contradiction and cultural no nuances through data visualizations? We, we will really like to, 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 have, to know your thoughts about these questions during the Q&A and to finalize. Uh, we wanted to say thank you to our amazing colleagues without whom this project could have never been developed. So thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you all so much for that fantastic paper. I see lots of applause and um, yeah, for those questions, which we will come back to. And it's really exciting to see all the connections between our first two papers already as well. I'm going to introduce our final speaker. Um, Mary Oaken, and congratulations are in order because Mary's PhD was conferred today. So congratulations. And uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Mary as holding a PhD in the history of art and architecture from UC Santa Barbara. Mary's also a lecturer at San Jose State University, specializing in the history of American art and digital humanities. And her paper will be challenging the American art canon with mass data, mining at 10th street, visualizing New York City's 10th Street Studio building. Over to you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. I am really delighted to be here. Can you hear me? That's great. Thanks, Mary. Um, uh, so I'm really delighted to be here, uh, and my uh, presentation concerns a digital humanities project that I've been developing as a side project to my dissertation, and it's still in its kind of nascent stages, uh, although we've just, uh, myself and my uh, former student and unpaid research assistant have just published an article recently, and I'll share in the chat with sort of preliminary findings. So I suppose I should say that we're still in search of a, of a method, but we've explored some, and I hope that'll be uh, interesting for, for people. Um, so I am a California-based Americanist with a specialty in histories of California painting. And uh, my research on California painters has made me curious over time about why it's the case that the measure, it seems, for determining an artist's significance and place in American art history is often bound to whether or not they achieve fame in New York. Uh, that seems to be a kind of pattern that you have to have an exhibition, whether you're a living or dead artist, to be considered important, and that New York is that kind of central place. Uh, so this project, um, which developed out of a graduate seminar where I was kind of, you know, you need to find a data set and explore it, um, has led me to really think about that and come up with at least some answers for the origins of that center of, of art being New York. Uh, the project has also um, helped me to challenge or explore the single author model. So it's lovely to see that among colleagues as well. Um, and to think about, you know, how to be part of a community that is experimenting with data. And I've had the great fortune to be uh, participating in the early stages of this project in something called the Tour de Moore Inclusive Digital Art History Initiative that was started by Panorama, the Journal of the Historians of American Art. So I've had a chance to work with Diana C. Breenwald and um, other folks, and it's been amazing. So thank you both to them and to my unpaid, wonderful research assistant, Celie Mitchard. So the 10th Street Studio Building, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, was the first building specifically designed to house artist studios in the United States. Uh, it was developed uh, and built in 1857, and it was demolished in 1956. Uh, this visualization in the middle is a uh, mapping visualization showing some of the historic structures uh, including the studio building that are uh, related to uh, its uh, patrons. And so what you see here on the left is the studio building at the very top, which I'll show you a, a larger image of in just a minute, uh, as, um, a stable, and then the, the house of the first owner of the studio building, a man named James Borman Johnston. This is his house on the left. Uh, on the right is the mansion of his older brother, John Taylor Johnston, who was a very important American art collector and also the first president and one of the founders of the Metropolitan 
Museum of Art, which was founded in a meeting at his home around the quarter and a couple of blocks over from the 10th Street Studio Building, which was founded or begun um, about 13 years earlier. So 1857 for the studio building uh, and 1870 for the Met. One of the things that we've been working on is to define or maybe redefine the studio building. So the most common definition, I would say in the art historical record and among the art historical community uh, is that it's a home for artists. So you can see in the image on the left, uh, the building, uh, the first building specifically designed to house artists, it has large windows, three stories of studio space that were ideal in their moment of creation. They were modern in a sense of artificial lighting, um, really large scale space with northern facing light, uh, a large front door through which, you know, grand works could circulate, and a two story gallery in the center where works of art could be exhibited. And for the first 50 years of its life or thereabouts, it was kind of a, a social club and creative space primarily housing important male artists. And the image on the right, a stereoscope photograph, is an example of um, that kind of community. So this is a, a photograph of Worthington Woodchurch's studio and some of the prominent male artists, uh, many of them landscape painters, uh, who were living in this building and working in close proximity to each other. Uh, in talking to uh, Diana Greenwald about this project, she also works on American art during this era, especially. Uh, she suggested thinking about this building in economic terms as a creative cluster. So thinking about the fact that artists are interacting with each other, that this building, which I had already kind of come to understand is an economic engine of a kind for developing the American art market and the American art community in a period where that's really a fledgling enterprise in the United United States. Uh, and so we began to kind of think about that further. Some of the artists, uh, the major artists really early on in this home for artists are people like Frederick, Frederick Edwin Church, excuse me, and his painting Heart of the Andes on the left, which was the first kind of blockbuster exhibition of American art, which took place um, about a year after the studio building opened for business. And on the right is a painting by William Merritt Chase, an American Impressionist painter who took over the large two-story gallery where Heart of the Andes had this blockbuster showing and turned it into the largest studio in this building, where, which was a kind of social hub and so on. If you walk into a room of 19th century American art, um, this is a room at the Metropolitan Museum's American Wing, you are going to encounter paintings by folks who lived at the 10th Street Studio Building. And so it's very central to the canon of American art. And it's interesting to study for that reason, um, not only to explore its very well-known artists, but as I've been doing, kind of bringing in more peripheral figures and trying to think through what they mean in relationship to what we already know about this structure and social network. So here's a, a Google and Graham visualization of the 10th Street Studio Building as a proper noun. Um, so to look at um, its presence or frequency in English language publications and where it shows up relative to the two artists I just showed you works uh, by Sir William Mary Chase and Frederick Edwin Church, as well as its two first owners. So James Borman Johnston and his older brother, John Taylor Johnston. And you can see that John Taylor Johnston has this kind of peak of recognizability during the period that he's the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which you see in an early photograph at the top here. If we look at a Google Ngram visualization of the 10th Street Studio building, so zooming into that from the visualization I just showed you, you can see that it starts to appear in the art historical record when it's first established, so in primary sources from the 1860s, uh, and then during its sale and demolition period in the 1950s, and then as it becomes of interest to scholars, particularly in the 1980s uh, and in the 1990s when Annette Blaugren who is 
the leading authority on this structure, began to develop her dissertation and the exhibition catalog that came from that work. Uh, so she is the first person to think of the 10th Street Studio Building as a data set and to create a list, a roster of tenants that she published and began to publish even before she, completing her dissertation, so in the early and mid-1980s. And she assembled a, a data set that listed all of the artists who she could identify who lived in the building. And that began to create an understanding of this community um, at a macro scale over the course of the first half of its life. Uh, this project, the Mining at 10th Street project, began with that kind of foundational data set. So that class I was taking where we needed to find a data set, begin experimenting with it. Her data set is pretty straightforward and um, limited in the sense of what she published. So it includes the first and last name of the artist, their life dates, their years of tenancy, and then their affiliation with the National Academy of Design, which was an organization with close affiliation to the studio building, its patrons, and many of its tenants. And I began by asking, you know, what could we add in terms of data uh, and how could we mine additional data that might give us further insights about this canonical community and building. So over the course of the last four and a half years, primarily using directories, professional directories and city directories, we've added substantially to uh, Annette's data. So her data is represented in green. She identified 159 uh, studio building tenants, a majority of them fairly well-known artists. And we've added another 260, it's probably more than that at this point, but in this snapshot of last year, about 260 artists, uh, a majority of them falling in the latter portion of the building's life. Um, and I'll say something uh, about the three kind of eras of ownership. Uh, and the mass data project began very simply, uh, which is just a kind of data val validation process, uh, which is to say, you know, trying to find where did she uh, how, where did she find her data and could I, living in California, far away from New York archives, um, validate her work and sort of like a data scientist, you know, test what she came up with as her conclusions and so on and see what else I could find. Of course, it's been since the 1980s that she conducted her research. There's a lot of digitized sources. You know, it was exciting to see what, what I could find. Um, so very simply, I Google searched for the address of the studio building and immediately city directories popped up and I began kind of searching for the building's address. And that led to also looking through periodicals and very quickly a much more complicated picture of the studio building emerged. Um, there were some challenges with that. Um, immediately it was clear that freely accessible sources were very limited and many of them unavailable. And that led me to you know, contacting the major resource for um, directory data for New York City, which is the New York Public Library. That institution has in their collection uh, city directories for the city of New York, and uh, they've digitized them and they're available to the public. However, they're not available in searchable form. And so, um, I contacted them to ask because, you know, going page by page and searching, you know, in a, a kind of analog way for a, the studio building address would be a gargantuan task that I don't think anyone has time for. Um, so I contacted them and found out that they license their um, directories through uh, Ancestry.com and its subsidiary uh, Fold3, which is a database with military records and um, city directories and other kinds of works. Um, not all all databases, that's one of them, are particularly user friendly. So we had to come up with techniques for how to locate, you know, how to search um, genealogical databases, for example, for a building rather than a specific individual, which poses, depending on the way the database works, a lot of <laughs> challenges. Uh, and then we had initial findings. So we discovered more artists and architects, uh, many of them obscure, uh, non-artist tenants. Uh, so adding professional diversity to the studio building, which city directories especially provide because they are less discerning than art world records, for example. Uh, women artists and women in general uh, began to appear in much greater numbers, particularly when we began to extend the data set into the 20th century. Annette's work sort of stopped at 1895 or so. 
And then we found organizations and businesses that led us to think about connections to capitalism and the development of New York City, not only as an art center, but as a center of finances or the financial world for New York City and the role that the patrons of the studio building who were major business owners and businessmen with power uh, in terms of economics and politics and the studio building as a phenomenon that's cultural and primarily thought of as this home for artists. We also discovered domestic staff. I think that's really interesting and important in thinking about the art world and the community of cultural production in general, that there are people who, you know, support that work. Um, in the case of the studio building, Margaret Winter, who provided lunches, for example, for the artists. Data assembly, I'm sure many of you who work on this, this isn't any sort of surprise, um, but we searched base for basic addresses and then had to come up with lots of variables for how they appear. So part of the project is documenting all the ways that you can find the studio building in the data. And similarly for the proper noun version of it, which varies as well from newspaper to newspaper and um, among different writers writing about it. So 10th Street Studio Building, the old studio building, 10th Street Studios, and so on. Some of the exciting findings uh, for us were the organizations and businesses especially. So the Studio Building Association was something that came up in the city directory and I don't think it's available or prominent in art world records. And that was an organization and a business that was founded by James Borman Johnston, along with a number of other patrons and including uh, artists of the studio building who were members of the patron class. It's listed in the city directory as having capital worth $500,000, which I think I tried to translate into today's money in dollars and it's like 10 billion or something. I don't know exactly what the translation is, but it's a lot of money for the 1860s. And that was really interesting in finding the corporate document related to that, seeing how the patrons of the studio building were really supporting the art market and doing all they can to promote the artists of the studio building, but also New York City as a center for American art and hopefully creating a kind of Paris or Rome with this particular um, project in New York City. So coming back to that idea of the patrons, I, I hope I've complicated that a little bit, that there's this money in connection to their appearance and presence in the historical record. Um, and that becomes apparent too when we add the Metropolitan Museum, for example, to this this um, visualization. So John Taylor Johnston, that like high peak in this visualization is this much smaller kind of mountain in comparison to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which this family also founded, and that was um, has outpaced the studio building. And that part is really important because the studio building wasn't just a cultural center, it was a business and it was treated as such. Whereas the Metropolitan Museum became a cultural um, institution, the studio building was a business. In fact, it was a real estate asset and a real estate venture early on that the liberal proprietor, as one of the newspapers says, without any anticipation of profit was now receiving 10 percent um, interest on the money invested and this is within a decade of founding a studio building. Uh, as time went on um, after the first two owners, so James Borman Johnson and his brother John Taylor Johnson, who were big patrons of contemporary art, as they, you know, left the world um, and left the studio building to John Taylor Johnson's son, who had less interest in contemporary art, the studio building sort of reverted more to a real estate asset than a contemporary art center. Uh, many of the famous artists began to leave. And uh, as a result, there is a, a kind of shrinkage of its appearance in the art historical record. Art, art critics were less interested in its tenants and there was a less um, what um, inviting um, or appealing uh, reason to be in the building if you wanted to be at the center of American art. And eventually the building was sold to its artist tenants, a cooperative was formed and that cooperative eventually dissolved because shares were sold and eventually it was sold to a real estate developer and um, demolished. 
One of the pieces of advice that um, Diana Greenwald gave us uh, was to consider in terms of telling the story of patronage of the building as a business of this like economic history of the art world and its relationship, meaning the studio building's relationship to the canon of American art was to track accessions of works of art by tenants of the studio building. And what you see in this visualization on the left are the three eras of ownership um, and the number of accessions of works of art by tenants of the studio building split along gender lines. So at the top, you see the era, the first era of ownership of JB and JT Johnston and the number of um, accessions of works by men and women of the studio building and the decrease of that over time, as well as the increase of the presence of women in the 20th century, which is something that our data set has documented in the sense that more and more women come to occupy the space at the same time that the studio building becomes of less and less interest to art historians, art critics, and so on. So we track sort of this, you know, the formation of the building as business, it's fall from grace in the in the art world, and some of that maps against data losses as well. So the data rich era of the studio building is that early period of time when its connection to American capitalism and patronage is really strong. And increasingly, there's less and less data available. And so the diversity of people that we've been able to find sort of shrinks a little bit. And that's one of the challenges that we're continuing to pursue is the 20th century data that is going to continue to hopefully emerge from more digitized directories and whatever else I can find on my next trip to New York, which I hope will, will gather more data, more access to data as well. So as press coverage dies down, um, there's less and less uh, information from the art world, the retirement and death of the artists in the second era of ownership, who were the most famous, um, also kind of leads to data losses. And then finally, the um, artist cooperative has the least amount of sort of presence in, in art world data. Um, and that reflects, of course, um, what happens when patrons completely um, disconnect, I think, from a contemporary art center that now is no longer the center, but a periphery of American art. That's really interesting for us because New York City and Greenwich Village emerged as uh, the center of the art world uh, internationally after the war, at least from the American perspective. And um, so the fact that the studio building is right at the heart of that, and yet also cultural periphery is allows for the exploration of tensions between center and periphery in a very uh, close proximity geographically to, you know, the things that we think about abstract expressionism, for example, um, and its relationship to this 19th century structure. I wanted to show very quickly, I hope I'm okay on time, um, very quickly um, some of the raw data and future directions for the project. So this is a visualization of data that it hasn't been cleaned about professions that city directories register. And you can see the kind of diversity or range of, of types of individuals who were tenants. This is a little bit deceptive because a single individual can register multiple professions. And so some of this variety is you know, connected to one person or a few people as opposed to many. But this shows you some of the kind of general categories in which tenants fall. So artists being one of the largest, architects and sculptors, not that surprising, but also merchants and lawyers and illustrators and businesses that give a much more complex and interesting view of the studio building and what we can think about and, and uh, explore within its history. Uh, we've also continued to pursue the story of its patrons and their social network, which is going to be one of the areas of expansion for the project. Uh, the father of John Taylor Johnston and James Foreman Johnston was a prominent Scottish merchant who, among other things, imported uh, linen from Scotland, which I think has a connection to providing materials to um, uh, plantations in the South where cheap linen was used to clothe the enslaved, as well as um, railroad and steel and so larger histories of industries in the United States. 
I also have started visualizing some of the marginalized communities. So this is a story map and I'll post the link in the chat rather than showing it to you of the women artists of the studio building who we've discovered and the kind of international and um, professional diversity and connections that they have to histories of the studio building. Um, I will post in the chat some of the uh, publications that we've started to create in case you're interested. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I love that at the beginning of your talk, you, you shared that you came to this subject through an interest in landscape painters in California. I think those kind of research trajectories are, are really fascinating and it, it's really helpful to kind of know that, that connection. Um, yes, the so marginalized have, genre in the exactly, United States. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, I think we should pick up on on that as a theme from these papers. Um, also encourage anyone listening to feed us questions for the Q and A space that we have now for about half an hour at any point. Um, if you would like to ask the panelists something, um, but I think yeah, coming coming back to this sort of very clear through line through all of your papers around canonicity and challenging those very rigid sort of inherited boundaries. Something I'm really curious about is how you think about the scope of your projects. I think that came up in different ways. Obviously something about working canonically is that you inherit a sort of container for your work, whether it's the life of an artist or people who are considered to be part of a particular movement. When you go beyond that in your research, how have you each dealt with questions of, of scope in, in a very practical sense, maybe for your work and, and you know, maybe in a kind of evolving way. Uh, Rian? Um, so I've already, you might have seen, I've already briefly answered this in my chat, in the chat. Um, the, I should say that my most collaborative PhD, which uh, Martin and um, my other supervisor, Richard Johns proposed, and I applied for it, uh, but I got to define the scope. So it was, I was looking, I decided to focus on landscape artist studios. I had to define London, which was not fun. So I used a map to like really set myself uh, a limit. And uh, 1780 to 1850, 1780 was the year that uh, Royal Academy moved to Somerset House and it really picked off the first, the age of exhibitions. And in 1851 was the great exhibition at Crystal Palace in Hyde Park. So that for me marked the beginning of the second age of exhibitions. So 1780 to 1850. Um, and I have, yeah, like I said earlier, huge appendices, like detailing how I defined a landscape painting, a landscape artist, like all the stratified sampling I use, because if I wasn't strict, I mean, my data set was huge as it was, uh, but it, I, I had far greater ambitions and I've probably done about a tenth of what I originally proposed. Um, so yeah, you could keep going forever, but I was really interested, what I did spend a lot, uh, my first few chapters on my thesis just defining is what is a studio? let alone what is a landscape artist studio, especially in an era much earlier than uh, Mary's research where the records are very thin on the ground, people mainly worked in their accommodation. How do we, uh, how do I account for that? So I just, I would say landscape artists are dresses. You know, they aren't more necessarily studios, but that's the closest we're gonna get unless more information comes to light. Mm, thank you. Ming? Thanks, Bailey. Um, so, our project is actually incredibly um, fluid and enormous and quite difficult to, to get a handle on. Um, but there are different parts of it that have um, more um, robust definitions and, and um, boundaries, one of which um, is the Slade London Asia portion of it, which, as you know, um, actually emerged out of a fellowship that I got at the Paul Mellon Center. Um, and like Rianne, I applied for this fellowship to work on London Asia um, within the context of pedagogies. And so that's when I started working on Slade and you know, found this incredible data set, which you know had to be extracted very, very um, laboriously, you know, by just by looking at each of the um, registrar's records and, and recording names. Um, but then, you know, I think that um, in thinking about the question of scope, it's really useful to have um, the multi-scalar approach that Rian was um, talking about earlier, where you know there are different 
levels of engagement with the the data in um, the project, meaning that you know some aspects of the project are really just to provide this larger context, and then other aspects of the project allow us to tell sort of um, more precise stories um, through a kind of. I mean, for me, what I, I think is really important is this concept of global microhistory that you find a very small site that allows us to tell um, stories about um, transnational um, global engagements from a critical perspective. So you have that kind of precision while also um, engaging with larger questions of the global. So um, I guess that's sort of a, a, an answer that sort of tries to, to have the best of both worlds. Um, but um, I, I think that, you know, th this um, question of the multi-scaler is really important. Thank you. I think I think something that came up in those answers as well um, ha has to do with the idea of sort of data ontologies and, and how we're kind of managing data sets and what is reflected in data and what isn't and and the question of definitions for terms, what you incorporate into your set and, and what you don't. I was wondering if you could share maybe some of your kind of tactics from your projects for dealing with what might be some of the inherited biases in how we might normally structure our historical data. I think for um, me, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Mary. I, I think for me, including you know folks like domestic staff and lawyer, and trying to sort out what are they doing in this building, um, you know, merchants, for example, or an undertaker. Um, I think, and in figuring out how to code, which we're still trying to to sort out um, these various professions and how do you quantify and explore the data that way. Uh, I think also. Um, you know, in some cases, names change slightly. So also how you identify individuals and working with a large data set, you can have all kinds of errors that, that pop in, which is part of the fun, I think, of <laughs> sorting that out. But uh, it makes, I think, I, there's all kinds of decisions that, that you can make in how to tell the story. And I think I'm still trying to sort out and as was just mentioned, you know, where the limits should be because the data set can expand in so many directions. We're thinking about education. I didn't show you a slide, but home addresses, for example, pop up in the directories and home addresses in New York City between 1857 and 1956. And the maps we have today are like wildly different. So, you know, trying to figure out how you geolocate them, which I think would be really fascinating. Um, I hope that answers that question a little bit. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it does. And, I, and it also um, there's, it sort of picks up on an interesting thread through the day, I think, which has been the value of, of errors and anomalies and how things that stand out or that don't fit in your data can actually point to things that really need attention. Um, Paul, I saw you raised your hand. Oh, no, it's actually related. Sorry, but I, I think Rian and Ming want to respond, so I'll, I'll wait for them. I'll defer to them. Okay, I'll come back to you. Um, Rian? Um, yeah, my biggest challenge was, um, and this is partly the motivation I, I understand for the RA Chronicles 250, was that so much of the exhibition history of London is based on the out on graves uh, dictionaries. And they were my go-to resource. I quickly realized that I could not go to all the exhibition catalogues individually. And this, by the way, I was doing my data collection six months ahead of the PMC digitizing there. So if I'd done my PhD two years later, it would have been so much easier. Um, but I had to do the analog, analog, go through all of the Graves dictionaries, deciding is that a landscape artist by my definition or not. Um, but Graves has his own errors and uh, biases. And oh, um, so I really wanted to make sure from an institutional perspective that I was um, cross-referencing from other institutions and that's why I was so heavy on tracking all of my processes so my database includes it down to the page number so if someone can find it finds a contradiction in the future brilliant flag it because um, I'm sure my own you know manual process has meant that actually I've probably made errors um, in the data in, in applying my own data and uh, but what I really was concerned about but I've had to just leave it as kind of a footnote a side project in the future is that as much as I've raised the issue of gender throughout um, my database, it doesn't address um, race and class and 
the colonial structures which actually are already within the initial cataloging of the artworks um, and the titles they used and the purposes of their works, the motivations for sending them to exhibition. So there are, I, I could propose another 10 PhDs just of all the different <laughs> directions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I get the sense that is a part of work like this that you have to, you, you know, you're identifying horizons around you all the time and there's a, a kind of sense of a selection as you go maybe as well. Um, I've had to accept that I just can't answer everything. So um, it'd be great to link up projects that other people can answer. Yeah. An invitation. Um, Ming? Um, well, I'd like to just use this opportunity to maybe open up a couple of things um, and then um, point to other members of our team that might um, want to take on the answer. Um, I think that for us, there are two places in which, you know, we're really thinking about um, how to address these questions of inherited biases. One of them is through the data itself. And, you know, as um, you just pointed out, um, Mary, there were just so many places in which we were making assumptions and, um, you know, also what you, you were saying earlier, Rian, um, just in terms of like, how do we identify who the foreign students are, you know, for certain um, periods of time in the records, um, the Slade kept um, very good um, records of who was coming from where. But otherwise, sometimes we really just had to rely on names that did not sound Anglophone, which meant that we were making giant assumptions about who was or was not a foreign student. And we missed out on a lot of students um, who had um, Anglophone names because of those colonial histories. Um, so, you know, over time, we had to find other ways of um, tracking and finding those students. Um, but then also in terms of the visualizations themselves. So I think Pansy probably has something to say about um, errors in her visualization and same with um, Janneke. And then Maribel probably has something to say about um, this question of data ontologies. Yeah, thank you, Ming. I think that's definitely something I can speak to. I mean, for me, it was less so about defining or like circumscribing the outside bounds of the data set and more about um, working with the data set to think differently about the sort of um, like to think kind of against the out of the box solutions that I think tend to be quite um, hard and sharp and non porous and linear in a way that I think um, tends to produce um, a, like a, um, a a flattening of the visual of the of the information that is being presented like via a visual model that that. Um, uh, implies a sense of certainty that I think is sometimes not necessarily there, you know, and that's a way that 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 data um, that the stories that the data tells can get, I think, flattened out um, and and um, lose some of the nuance that I think is so vital to taking this kind of decolonial approach. Uh, and so for me, it was really about working with the um, the data set we had to try to reinscribe what I think was a really core part of it, which was this sense of, um, you know, that we are trying to find um, poetic, um, geopolitical, social, historical links that are, that that have the, there is a potentiality of them being there that is told by the data that that we don't we don't necessarily know, and so all the different like I was saying in the in the presentation all the different variables associated with the mind's visual qualities can be um, encoded, uh, encoded with quantitative or qualitative data, um, and that can be a way of you know like it's it, this is I think what contributes to the sense of kind of materiality of the the visualization this kind of like charcoal drawing look. Um, is because of this uh, way of trying to acknowledge and in fact put at the forefront the uh, the kind of the the margin of error, so to speak, in, in, in the data set. Um, but that requires really using like not out of the box solutions. I mean, like, you know, it like I was using Blender, which is incredibly robust, but it's uh, it's it's quite hands on in some ways. Um, and so to me, that's like a pretty core part of like countering um, one of the biases of like visual um, presentations of data that can be quite, I think, in some ways reductive. Um, yeah. Am I allowed to jump off of what Pansy was saying? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I also resonate with the thought of using out of the box 
So out of the box visualization platforms, a lot of people on this call were using Tableau to visualize their data. I did that too with the network visualizations, but I kind of had to use a few different platforms like Jeffy to uh, generate coordinates for the network visualization before putting it into Tableau. So even combining different systems to get an end result that you want to have is there's some extra steps that need to be taken along the way. And the major frustration that I had when I was making this network visualization was making sure that we had the time element as a part of it because the networks, like all everything in one view doesn't tell you much if you don't have the time element to it to tell you which artists knew each other at which time. So we needed that extra level of information, but I had to be very reductive with how I used the times in the network visualization, some artists we had very specific, like day, month, year for when they were at an exhibition. Other artists, we just had a single year. And I had, or there was like a lot of uncertainty about dates. For example, in art history, you see a lot of circa this year or a range of years that an artwork was produced over. So to deal with these types of dates, it's difficult when you try to make a visualization in a platform like Tableau because they just want a strict date. <laughs> I don't know who I'm saying when I say day, but the platform just wants a strict date to be put into the system. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. You get a lot of null values and the data just doesn't look like it. It works in the end. So what I had to do is I had to reduce all of the dates in our data set to just a year, which I felt really bad about. Like I was sitting behind my computer pulling my hair being like, oh, should I really do this? It like gets rid of all of the information that we <laughs> that we have in our data. But it, it, it was necessary to create the network visualization. And something that I've been doing in a recent project is I, I added an extra category called datedness to my data. And I, well, this was a set where I had a lot of data that had circa 1960, for example. So what I did was I took apart the circa and the 1960 part. I kept the 1960s and the strict years in all the data that I represented. And then in the tooltip or the box that you can get when you hover over a data source, you could see the what I was calling the datedness of the data and let's see it like it was circa 1960 or it was part of this range of dates. So you have to try to be kind of un unconventional with the way that you present your information. Yeah, I love that idea of introducing a new dimension in the data to indicate degrees of certainty, right? Or degrees of possibility um, and, and working with that instead. Maribel, would you like to jump into? Yes, and also I, I see that there is a related question on the Q&A um, about <laughs> specifically the, uh, basically the, the ontologies and how we are dealing with that. Uh, so, I, I mean, I would, I would speak more about what we are doing in world in public cultures, which is an approach that we are going to adopt probably uh, in, in these projects, because we basically we decided to adopt the CDOC CRM uh, model, which is like very, you know, well established, recognized. Also, we have a member in the project who belongs to the to the to the SIG of, of the CDOC CRM. And I mean, it's it's quite problematic. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't accommodate all, all types of data it's it, you know it's a reductive is it, it basically represents um I mean, it, it's a representation of a, of a certain view about uh cultural heritage and 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 arts and, and everything so we started with uh basically with um trying to expose and and critique the the biases that are in the CDOC CRM and in the classes and properties uh that we are using um, our plan. We we also like did this very collaborative in, in a very very kind of um, a collaboratively um, collaborative yeah collaborative way. So um, so basically, we had like sessions in which we were like um, uh, looking at the different classes and properties and and with all you know from all all different backgrounds because the word in public cultures project has. Uh, many scholars um, coming from, you know, from many different parts of the globe, and also especially in, in in many disciplines and and areas. So, so we've been trying to highlight basically the gaps, omissions, and problems uh, that exist in the CDOC CRM. And our plan is at the moment is just like to highlight in our database once it gets developed, like visually 
have um, warning signs, pop-ups that when you are like checking the database, you can see the, the problems behind the schema. And I mean, the if you if we really want to decolonize the CDOC CRM, we you we, we probably should um, uh, basically communicate what the problems are with the CDOC CRM and ask for for more like um, kind of. I mean, like like a stronger intervention um, and and if, and changes. Um, because uh, I mean, it's of course like we need to to use it because of uh, because this is the way we can share data with other researchers, other institutions. But at the same time, there are so many limitations and problems with it. So the first step, of course, is like uh, highlighting what the problems are and the biases. But we need to take a step forward and and make like more drastic changes in the CDOC CRM. Thank you so much. That's so yeah. That's really interesting to hear about. And maybe that that before inventing an entirely new system as a process of like critical annotation, maybe within the systems that are being used currently, and that that is a level of research and, and analysis as well within the project. Um, Paul, would you like to to jump in? Mary, did you have something else you wanted to say or on that line? I was just going to quickly add, I forgot to say that that one of the findings that that one of the things that the data doesn't show, maybe um, for, for my data set, um, and that's difficult to find is ethnicity. But I think generalizing from what we have been able to see, one of the interesting things about the studio building project is it seems to be a kind of case study in whiteness and and therefore um, the issue of exclusion in the canon of American art. Um, so that's one area of expansion that I think will be interesting given how closely related the studio building is to, especially in the 19th century, to the canon of American art. So I just wanted to respond that that's, that's a very, that's a challenging and I think also really worthwhile um, aspect of these kinds of data sets to pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Now I'll jump in if I may. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> Is that uh, yeah? That's really it's really interesting discussion, and, and it makes me think um, uh, particularly uh, of someone like Jessica Johnson. There's a wonderful article on markup bodies, which is a kind of critique of the transatlantic slave trade. A critique and a complement of this very difficult and very interesting history, uh, but I want to I want to pick up on 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 Ming's kind of challenge of of, of decolonizing this. And, and level a kind of um, uh, you know raise a question about the resolution uh, of our data in the sense that what we've all done and this is very much a critique of our work too is we've kept the resolution at the biographical we, we've kept it at the level of the individual artist uh, at the individual patron um, I, I'm wondering if that's part of the problem right if if you're working with the Benin bronzes you're never going to know the artist you're just not. Or the you know, and whether it's one artist or several artists, um, if you're working on other kinds of periods, so so at some points uh, to you know the the, the biographical um, says the man working with the dictionary of art historians, the biographical really limits us uh, in terms of decolonizing, and so I guess it's really is an honest question of can we imagine a different resolution? Uh, is it the group? Is it the community? Are, are there other ways in which we can confront? Uh, which is clearly uh, a, a real bias in the very nature of art history itself. So. Brian, would you like to, to answer that? Oh, I was going to just respond and say, I suppose that then takes us onto what is art and how do we value it? And you know, then what culture, cultural perspective are we coming from? Um, and right, you know, in Western art, the entire value is on the artist, well, predominantly on the artists themselves, isn't it? And then you get the myth of the artist. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I could go forever, sorry. Yeah, Ming, go ahead. No, go, please go ahead. I'm, I'm trying to find something for us. Um, there was a, a database that I um, heard a presentation about um, that actually was focused on the objects um, and on a group of our ob objects and, and allowing those objects to sort of animate communities. Um, but let me just, I'm just gonna pull myself out for a bit and I'm gonna look for it for you. That sounds good. Um, Mary. 
I was going to say, you know, for some of if for the 20th century data for the studio building, a lot of the the people we identify or the individuals we identify are are obscure. So while we have their names, we don't know much about them, their relationship to the art world or the studio building. Um, and I, I think through them um, and just thinking about all of the other people who circulated within the space. So students, for example, for somebody like William Merritt Chase, there is that kind of, I don't know, haunting of the canon and haunting of the what we know or don't know. Um, you know, the other thing about directories, which is where kind of we've started and we, we haven't expanded like Annette did into artist diaries and letters and, and whatever, you just get an annual snapshot. So it's, you know, it's such a superficial view of what actually is going on um, and the mess of the art world on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I, I think that's where data losses are really interesting of, of how much do you not know? And is there a way to, to measure that and sort of evaluate what the data losses indicate about our assumptions as art historians of what's important and what isn't, and, and maybe the limits of what we can know about the history of art. Um, I think that's really fascinating. Um, and I haven't gotten to the point of, of who created what kinds of objects and what could we, you know, what kind of, I'm just, I'm still at the level of names. Um, so that all th I think will be really interesting as well. Thank you. Yeah, and it is, it feels really resonant for all of these parts to think about reading into the meaning of gaps and to giving those just as much, as much importance as, as what is represented. Um, I'm mindful of time. This is such a fascinating discussion. I see three hands raised and, and maybe so we can um, hear from Martin and then Paul and then Ming and then have to wrap up. Um, Martin, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick uh, because I've, I've, sort of, I've sort of addressed this elsewhere in writing, but uh, something which I'm observing during today is, and thinking about a little bit is how, um, and this is really kind of the, the point, which is the question that was being raised there. If we stop short of actually formulating a biography and accept that our identifications of, you know, the people that we're dealing with as artists or as art historians are always contingent and always qualified. If we don't kind of try and trace a life, but we actually stop short of that and say, well, we're going to deal with the residents of you know, 10th Street, or we're going to deal with the people who are at the Royal Academy, or we're going to deal with the people who are identified as landscape painters and commercial directories, then you then you do have a kind of data set which is more reliable because you're not creating it. You're not creating it. In, 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 there, are, there are kind of givens out there. Um, and of course, you can start mapping those givens onto one another and come up with certain you know, suppositions or or claims. But I think maybe maybe that's an issue that that we do kind of mobilize um, a set of expectations about consistency or coherence around uh, which come with kind of biographical data. If we stop short of that, almost kind of just work with the raw data rather than trying to form it into biographies, you might end up with something rather interesting. Thank you. Paul? Oh, uh, you're still muted, Paul. Very briefly, I've been thinking about some of these uh, issues and the idea of dealing with gaps by looking at contemporary data and learning from that and then projecting backwards with some of those lessons in mind. Um, because there's so much more data available more recently, it's like looking under a street light in, instead of uh, out in the darkness. So there seems an interesting possibility to develop some strategies that way and also explore some um, different perspectives beyond the biography. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Ming, would you like to? Sure. Um, I think that, um, so I did find it. I will put um, the Great. website, uh, the URLs in the chat right now. It's a website called Mapping Philippine Material Culture by Christina uh, Juan. And um, what's really interesting about it and what the question that it asks for me is, who are these databases for? Who are we serving with these um, the, the, the use of this technology? And um, what she has done is really interesting in that she has mapped Filipino um, objects of material culture in overseas collections, which then allows um, people in the Philippines to know where there's, those objects are, to access what they look like, because in many cases, the um, Every example of the, those um, 
heritage objects exists outside of the Philippines. And so for craftspeople who um, are engaging in the process of you know, cultural recovery, it's critical for them to be able to figure out where these objects are and what they look like. And more, many of them are you know, not going to be able to travel to those collections, but she's able to share those photographs with them. And also, you know, by speaking with the cultural producers um, on site, she's also, um, you know, creating a dialogue which provides greater knowledge about those objects. So I think it's really um, not just a question of, you know, what is the data that we're um, tracking and what, but how are we using it and who's it, who is it for? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. That That feels like a really great question to to kind of end on in a way the question of, of who, who is using these databases projects um what audiences they they are serving and for what what purposes and i'm I, this has been such an interesting discussion i'm really grateful that we have another um space for discussion in the day so we can come back to some of these questions and i think especially also around questions of artist biography and and maybe alternative modes whether it's looking at objects or thinking about where data around communities lives and what that looks like um, would be really fascinating so just a huge thank you to all of our, our speakers on this panel and um and really to everyone also for you know contributing to the discussion it's been so interesting and yep applause and um we all have a break now until 4 p.m so um, we'll see you back then when we will hear from Hans Hunnis. Thank you so much, everyone.
Well, welcome back, um, everyone. I can see panelists' cameras uh, going on. So I hope um, those of you on screen, as well as those of you who are joining us uh, for this conference, have had a, a very good, quick, short uh, break filled with uh, caffeine and other simulating substances as needed um, to power us through to the uh, but the the final part of what has been a really, really um, stimulating set of conversations. And for this final section of the um, of this conference workshop, whatever we want to call it, we've invited um, someone who we know is going to think with us with a historical lens um, and we've invited um, Dr Hans Hoernes who's a lecturer in art history at Aberdeen University um, to give a, a paper slash response slash thought piece um, that we thought would sort of not wrap things up but kind of present us with some ideas and strands um, for further discussion. Let me just tell you a little bit more about Hans. Um, in 21 to 22, he held the Paul Mellon Centre's uh, Research Collection Fellowship, um, which centred on a project on British art historiography, uh, particularly the collection of the papers of Paul Oppe that we have um, at the centre. But Hans has also worked extensively on the history of art history and art theory since the 18th century, and has written and edited numerous books, including those on Heinrich Wolflin um, and 18th century antiquarianism and uh, as well as uh, projects on Abbey Warburg and his new um, monograph uh, which is a biography of Abbey Warburg is forthcoming as well um, and uh, through our conversations with Hans both around um, the research collections fellowship and other publications and other papers he's given for us at the Paul, Se Paul Mellon Centre we've really sort of opened up thinking about data gathering in different forms and mass data methodologies um, and their historiographies. And we've had really interesting conversations about data and disciplinary formation within the context of the Paul Mellon Centre that's been thinking about the context of the formation of British art studies and the, the historiography of art history in Britain. Um, and so those, I, those questions and those strands of thinking really um, made us think that Hans would be a wonderful person to speak at the end of today and give some historical or historiographical um, perspective to some of these questions about mass data methodologies. So Hans, thank you so much for being here and uh, responding to our invitation and I'll hand over to you now. Thank you so much, Sarah. My greatest pleasure and uh, I'm very much enjoying the day so far. Um, even though it is, as uh, Sarah has already indicated, uh, uh, quite a bit of a different cup of tea to what I'm normally doing. I hope you can see my screen uh, in the meantime. If I don't hear anything uh, uh, to the contrary, I assume all That's is great, good. Hans. Thank you. Um, so Sarah has already indicated that this is going to be more of a historical paper. And I am certainly not somebody who can claim any active experience uh, in working with uh, digital methods in art history. Uh, so I hope you will excuse a slightly left fielded contribution here. And I hope you will also excuse that I think I have taken the uh, topic a bit um, too literal, maybe, because what I am going to do is focus very much on the question of mass and the role of thinking about masses in art historiography. And what I want to do is looking back into mainly early 20th century German art historiography to think about the relation between an interest in data and an interest in masses as in larger populations. And I fear, I feel, I, I feel and fear that the relation between the two might not be quite as smooth as maybe, maybe the title of the conference uh, uh, today does suggest. Um, right, this is enough of an introduction. I am going back um, to the foundations of um, art history, as indicated. And I feel I, I am at liberty to do so because, as all of you might know, this is a very prominent motif 
in digital approaches to art history uh, as well. Um, as all of you will be very aware, a lot of writing about digital art history is indeed precisely drawing uh, on the great names of the field in order to forge something like a genealogy, I guess, for uh, uh, current concerns and approaches. Um, I'm, I'm quoting him because he's also here today, Paul Jaskett, for example, in 2020, uh, explicitly uh, um, highlights that we should return to Wolfnien, to an art historian looking at vast numbers of examples of early modern European art, and that this makes us hopefully rethink what the very core substance of our field is. And precisely this importance of data in art writing of the early, early 20th century, and it's, it's kind of epistemological status, if you want, is what I want to query in the following. Um, well, I, think, I assume everybody knows, but essentially the principles, of the, the point is that he uh, wants to write an art history without names. So an art history that is not focused on the individual artist, but does a kind of um, yeah, distant looking exercise, essentially, where an ana analysis of artistic styles allows us to cluster artworks uh, according to different stylistic categories. So, for example, uh, uh, clustering linear artworks uh, versus painterly artworks, Renaissance art versus Baroque, German art versus um, um, Italian art, essentially what Paul's got here in the quote, just to uh, reiterate that a little bit. Um, I found it really interesting that uh, Paul is in that quote, sorry Paul, again for, for dwelling on your work here uh, quite extensively, I, I think you're absolutely right by the way in what you're writing here, so um, this is this is not meant to kind of start into a critique of anything, and just using it as a handy quote. I find it quite interesting though that you that highlighted in the quote are the opposition pairs of Renaissance and Baroque and um, Italian and German. Uh, one could say that these namely mark two categories or two, two kind of clusters that are quite far away from the constellations that interest us primarily in this workshop. Uh, Merflin indeed has very little interest in categories of population statistics. He's not interested in things like artistic skills. He's not interested in workshops. And indeed, he also very early on abandoned interest in connoisseurship and kind of clustering works around a single artistic name. Um, anything that has to do with people, in other words, seems to have not immediately a place in this art history without names. And I think this is telling. Um, early attempts towards a big data art history, if we want to name it uh, that, sorry, um, if we want to name it a uh, big data art history, um, are, I argue, precisely not interested in data about masses, about groups and movements, as the workshop abstract phrases it. Um, on the contrary, something like the mass was anathema to a man like Worthley. Uh, I'm giving you here a few quotes about from his early book, uh, Renaissance and Baroque, uh, uh, published in 1888, where he speaks about the masses in Baroque art in a strikingly uh, negative form. The masses of unformed blocks of stones instead of cornices, the corners dull, everything bursts out into the seams and chaos reigns over the space. So where, where mass comes in as a category, it seems to be primarily uh, associated with chaos. Baroque art, which is characterized by, by massish kind, so by, by a massiveness, if you want. Uh, uh, Baroque art takes recourse, he writes, to outrageously strong modes of expressions that are caused by a general dulling of the nerves. Uh, so, those artists that have an affinity to mass seem to be uh, of, of actually quite a, a dubious uh, mental makeup, if you want. Um, and this is a common characteristic in a lot of Wolfine's writings. Uh, mass is considered as exclusively negative, and that also uh, um, spills over from the fuller description of what mass is into an analysis of social spheres. The chaos of the Baroque masses in Berlin is regularly compared to the aristocratic composure and order of the Renaissance. 
the Renaissance being an elite culture where a sect few are reigning in complete order and distinct uh, uh, kind of separation from each other instead of the clustering that's associated with the term of Mars. So Wolfgang's art history without names is anonymous, is maybe big data, but I feel it is distinctly not mass data, not something that is interested in unified groups of populations. There's nothing in Wolfgang of the say socialist pathos of the masses, which is coming up at around the same time that he is writing. I'm showing you here uh, just the cover of, of one of the famous, uh, most famous expressionist plays of the period, and Stoller's uh, um, piece, uh, Mass Human, Masse Mensch, where um, he kind of is it's one of these great pieces of literature that restages, in a way, the Greek chorus and brings that back into modern literature, and where the uh, mass of the workers is one of the key features, right? That they appear as a unified whole and speak with one voice in the chorus. Um, and if, if, if somebody has to be singled out and has to be speak uh, uh, on their own, then this person is called der Namenlose, the anonymous. So uh, the idea here is that masses sing in unison. And that precisely is what somebody like Wolfling clearly couldn't stand, right? Wolfling's approach and Wolfling's anonymous data-driven idea of art history pre precludes precisely any such clustering according to population characteristics. In many respects, it literally voids the individual and does not want to you know, even give the individuality of a name to the protagonists of his art history. At the same time, however, Wolfgang was very much interested in biographical approaches, perhaps paradoxically so. Uh, he wrote famous books about Albrecht Dürer, for example, um, who is time and again appearing as a special individual in Wolfgang's work. Yet the interesting thing about it is that he characterizes Dürer not necessarily in a, in, an, in a kind of affirmative positive way, so with positive attributes, but mainly in a negative way, in, as a negative way of description, right? Dura is not great because of what he did, but because of, as it's here in the quote, because of what he has overcome. The etching here, Ritter, Tod und Teufel might be a bit stiff, but Wolfgang concludes it is this restraint, even for us today, that is the root of the moral power of this man. One is almost tempted to speak of a morality of vision in Dürer. So what we've got here is a description of Dürer, the artist, who is described as somebody who, well, quite similarly like an art history without names, voids itself from himself from certain characteristics. His moral power is restrained that takes back pairs back the individuality that is often in you know, biographical art history seen as the driving force behind artistic development. And I find that fascinating because what I see here coming together is on the one hand side, a data-driven methodology that is interested in anonymity in an art history without names. And on the other hand side, a personal ethic that is also interested in, well, maybe not anonymity, but a pairing back of individuality. So the restraint to not come forward as an individual is here deemed as something that is evidence of a specific morality in an artist like Dürer. The decision to pursue data-driven art history, in other words, I, I would contend, is in part motivated by a personal ethic that is driving Wolfgang personally. The ethos of an art history without names is a form of denial that potentially can, as a Dura, lead to a reformation of self. 
I hope what I mean here becomes a little bit clearer when I uh, uh, switch to another example, incidentally, another man that I wrote a book about. So I wonder always how, how, I, how you find your examples, um, right? Um, but no, I'm, I'm, and the man I'm talking about is A.B. Warbrick. Uh, I'm choosing him, of course, also because he too, like Wolfling, is often seen as one of these kind of uh, father figures of, of digital approaches to art history or more big data approaches to art history. I'm sure all of you know that better than me, that works like his Atlas Memocine, where he uh, kind of uh, traces certain pictorial motifs across different periods and geographies, that this often was seen as a kind of uh, uh, early stage of, of linking and networking uh, uh, pictures, not for their social historical context, but because of something like, like uh, you know, uh, what computer vision it does, right? Recognizing motifs and then kind of following them across uh, uh, different periods. Um, I could say a lot about what I think about this particular interpretation of Warburg's work. Um, I shall only say here at this point that I think uh, that it is important to highlight that Warburg was while he was doing these experimental arrangements, also a staunch defender of historical positivism. And that is the very reason why he was also very interested in data as a resource. Um, he advocated throughout his life the accumulation of facts as a matter of personal academic ethos. Truffle pig services is what he once called that in his diary in 1907. The truffle pig, of course, is somebody who digs out facts, but then lets them go, right? And somebody else collects the truffle and eats them. He is not the one who exploits them. Uh, but this is precisely what for Warburg earns the highest praise because it is, as he once told, termed it, a self-renunciatory labor that uh, kind of uh, does something purely for the service of a higher good. Uh, true science, Warburg uh, uh, wrote, uh, is marked by calm and sovereign approaches and is free from all grandi uh, envious grandiloquence. Uh, again, for Warburg, uh, working with big amounts of data is also a form of self-denial. As soon as you get, get, get into the role of, of staunch historical positivist who, 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 scout, who, who um, sifts through the archive and piles up materials, um, you are also the one who takes back your individual desire to shine, if you want. Um, here in the quote on the top left in a letter to his friend Andre Jonas, I think that comes through very, very clearly, where he says, I too was born in Platonia, so the platonic realm of ideas, but such soaring movements are not for me. I have to look backwards and cast my eyes with a philological gaze down to the soil. So what is happening here is that a data-driven approach is very much contrasted with an interpretive one, while at the same time, the data-driven kind of collection impulse is seen as the uh, ethically superior one. Warburg himself indeed contended that the good God is in the detail, as he famously once noted, um, which is something that, not without coincidence, uh, draws upon God and the language of theology in the expression here. Um, by the way, there's, there's many similar other authors at around the same time who say things like that. Eduard Spranger famously said it's the, the task of the historian to study in the tangible singular things, the an, intangible divine, divine whole. What we've got here in general is, I think, a very strong ethical streak uh, that is aligned with the demands of, of Protestant ethics that were propagated by leading theologians of the time. It's this idea, I won't go into that, the culture protestantismus. So, so Protestantism as a cultural force more than a religious one. Uh, Adolf von Harnack, for example, the most important theologian of his time, argued that self-denial is what Jesus demands. Self-denial to the degree of self-renunciation. And I think what Warburg and Werfling both are advocating 
by, by you know, taking themselves out as of the equation, but by recoursing to the language of data, is to perform an act of self-renunciation as here demanded in these uh, uh, Protestant ethics. Uh, so I think this is an important point. Attempts at data or a data driven art history were frequently driven by a desire to abstain from more interpretive, authorial ways of writing art history. Statistics as a means of self denial, if you want. An art history without names tried to transcend the merely social sphere and enter into a more abstract aesthetic realm. Um, again, I think this is just important briefly to highlight, not entirely, not, not restricted to, to German debates, um, the, the same impetus of kind of the selflessness of, of data mining uh, can equally be traced in, in British historiography. John Bagnet Burry, for example, um, the uh, famous Cambridge historian of the early 20th century, or art historians such as Basil Taylor, the founding, founding director of the Paul Mellon Foundation for British Art, so the precursor of today's institution, who also uh, argued for the importance of statistical research in uh, art history, and very much uh, saw that, saw statistical research as an attempt to, to steer clear from projects and enterprises which are really too ambitious for the present stage of knowledge. Um, so again, there's this idea that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a focus on data needs to quell over the ambitious freewheeling interpretation, and I, I, I argue that at least in the German debates, this is characterized by a self-denial and a Protestant ethos of renunciation. So data in that sense very much seems to me opposed to the, the idea of mass, to, opposed to the idea of an association of people who belong to a kind of amorphous social group. And I think this is corroborated when we look at some of the authors that, quite soon after Wolfling, turned to this very category of mass, turned to categories of populations that are bigger than one, or at least not entirely anonymous. Um, so, are we talking about mass versus data? I think we do. And in order to uh, um, give more meat to the bone here, I would like to look at two of Wolfling's successors in, uh, to, on his chair in Munich. So Wolfling was a professor at Munich until uh, in 1924. He took quite suddenly early retirement and left this very important chair vacant. And uh, then he had a succession of successors. I will focus on the first two here today. Uh, and those are Max Houtmann and Wilhelm Pinder. And what I want to show you here is how their interest in masses in, in bigger amounts of populations, where on the one hand side, an attempt to kind of push back against Wolfling, to push back against this very re renunciatory idea of an anonymous art history without names, but also on the other hand side, the attempt to still kind of do justice to Wolfling's legacy of a quasi-scientific history of art. Uh, I'm starting with Houtman, um, who's uh, certainly not a very well-known character, um, also because he uh, committed suicide, actually, after only, uh, I think, two years after being in, in post in Munich. Um, it's never quite clear why he got appointed in the first place, to be perfectly honest. Uh, he was mainly a historian of Bavarian church architecture, and that is also the subject of his most ambitious work, the history of uh, church architecture in Bavaria in the early modern period, essentially. Um, published in 21, so uh, six years after Wolfling's Principles. Um, the interesting thing is that the preface on the one hand side makes very clear that this is um, a work that is committed to follow Wolfling's principles and the kind of developmental ideas that he's presenting here. But on the other hand side, it is also a work that is not based on data in the strict sense of the word. It is not a catalog style text based on archival work, etc. Instead, he wants to flesh out the great lines, the historical structures of development. For our purposes, I'm particularly interested here in the first chap chapter, which is dealing with architects and patrons. 
uh, for, for Bavarian church architecture. Here, Hautmann draws on an empirical, statistical way to map artists. This is just one of the many charts that illustrate this book. Um, what he is doing here is to map essentially the, the structure of organization in church architecture. So he maps, for example, the profession of individuals, he maps in which time they flourish and work, and he maps whether they are indigenous German artists or whether they are foreigners who came from somewhere else. So essentially a big table of what was going on in Bavarian church architecture. Um, here's a second of these uh, um, diagrams that he is drawing, where he is mapping uh, the uh, indigenous uh, um, German architects who increasingly you know, become more important against the uh, foreigners who uh, kind of are here the kind of dotted line that remains a bit more unimportant. Um, so on the one hand side, this seems to be a very empirical approach, if you want. But I think it is anything but merely statistical. Um, the aim of Hartmann's is rather to filter out two trends. First, the gradual prevalence of trained architects and builders. And second, the rise of German artists who slowly sidelined the foreigners that dominated Renaissance and early Baroque art. So once we come to the 18th century, uh, the Germans, the indigenous people are, are much more important. Um, there is no doubt about the contemporary, con contemporary thrust of the argument this Hartmann is making. Um, in fact, much of what he wants to show us here is um, an aporia of the effects of war, for example. He writes about the 30 year war and how that essentially cleansed the entire German population and puts an end to the unrootedness and hybrids who don't know where they belong. The war, he writes, leads all rela 